change my OBS filter. There we go. So we get the entire chessboard for 3D pieces. I've made a study because, you know, I've actually been playing over the board. Crazy, that concept. You can find respectful opponents over the board. They play well, they make you think, and they don't cheat. Um, unless you go to, like, a huge money tournament, and then cheating becomes a much larger concern. But... Yeah, your typical weekend event, which this was not. This was actually me participating in an invitational, um, meaning that a local tournament director decided that um, he wanted to try to gather many of the strongest players from um, across the area and have them all participate in this local event. And so... I said, sure, this is good for our local chess community, and I'd be glad to participate in it. And um, it does also help the Arbiter get his certification, which is a minor point, but it's, yeah, it's great for the community. So here I am, finding myself Friday night, playing a chess game. Um, in fact, let me update my stream title to indicate that this is now chess. Um, so we were playing, uh, we were doing something creative, and now we are analyzing over the board games. Uh, status, um, OTB analysis, OTB postmortem would be more accurate on leechess.org. Okie dokie. Here we are. So yeah, I was playing here Friday night. Um, it's shown up uh, a bit after work. And so round time, I believe, was 7 p.m. Meaning that this game could, uh, and I won't spoil anything, but it could go to midnight because we were playing, I think it was 90-30. Each player starts with 90 minutes on the clock. Um, and where is it 60? I'm pretty, no, it is 90-30. That's right. Each player starts with 90 minutes on the clock. Every move, you gain 30 seconds. And this ensures that, for the most part, players have a reasonable amount of time to think. We're not FIDE, we're not playing some sort of like five minute, although, I mean, that could be fun too. We're not playing like game 60, um, like, I don't know, professionals are being asked more and more frequently to do. We're actually given some time to be able to think about our moves. We are required to take notation throughout the event, but, um, and yeah, I was somewhat unfamiliar with whether it was increment or delay. I thought it was increment like most FIDE tournaments tend to do, at least in my area, and I was correct. USCF loves delay. Um, I'm actually not such a fan once you get into extreme time trouble. I'd be more of a fan of Byoyomi uh, above everything else, but if you can't do Byoyomi, then at least do increment so players have a time to think. So that all said, finding myself at an actual chess tournament in real life, um, and this might come as a bit of a surprise uh, to most people, uh, especially followers of the stream, that I opened with the queen pawn. Um, you might ask, what am I doing opening Queen Pawn, given that most of my slow, most of my 45, well not, I've not played in 4545, I've watched some 4545, but I've played in the Twitch Chess Ladder before. Most of those games I opened with C4. Um, if you've seen analyses of my other over the board games, which I think I've done from time to time on here. I think I've opened with everything other than Queen Pawn. Um, so I've opened with the English, the King Pawn, King's Knight opening maybe, I don't remember. 
opened with the From Gambit, I think, or at least the Fred um, 1F4. I'm sorry, that's the Bird. The Fred would be a fun thing to play, too, but that's not something I'm doing at the moment. Um, so, yeah. I was more than a bit surprised uh, to see my opponent, who is slightly lower rated than I am, but that's okay. He's doing excellently in this tournament, I'll say. Um, but, yeah, he opened um, with this, uh, with knight f6. And so I'm playing c4. I'm like, okay, fine. If you want to play this hypermodern stuff, we can do that. Um, and honestly, I had expected something, I don't know, less um, this very much hypermodern, like c5 I'd expected. Um, let me just put that on the board. So I was expecting something of maybe c5 or e6 or maybe, I don't know, d6 trying to get the e pawn pushed quickly note that if you do to play c5 white just takes it that's not especially good for black because then this knight gets kicked for um well to anywhere really it doesn't have much of a home there but c5 tends to be quite popular um leading to either the benko uh, which is also popular or the benoni which um I'm not sure why people play this. Um, like, if you're going to play something fun, this is fun. The Benoni is okay, but it's a really ballsy decision against a high-rated player. And by that, I mean anybody over 1,800. If you're playing a Benoni against them, I mean 1,800 USCF, although probably FIDE as well. If you're playing a Bedoni in a serious, like, game 60, game 90, or even longer, um, you better have experience playing that. Because you will get cramped. A Benko, worst case, you're just losing a pawn. That's okay. You get tons of counterplay. It's a really exciting game. Anyway, we didn't get any of that. We got um, pawn g6, which... Um, Oh man, I wish I could hide this main menu up here. Pardon me for having that up there. Uh, I have this up here because I can't get the top of this king onto the display and have the board maximized unless this menu is visible. So pardon the little distraction there. Um, but yeah, g6. So we're going through this hypermodern stuff. I try to discourage my opponent from going into, um, well, I try to encourage him to play something like c6 or d6, um, or even c5. Uh, that's, I mean, bishop g7 is the most logical move on the board, but I just give him one more opportunity to not go where we're going next. You know, if you wanted to play something a little more reasonable, a little less theory-heavy, I gave him that opportunity. And even here, d5, there's tons of alternatives. He could still play c5 if he wanted to. He could still play d6. He could castle. Um, honestly, castle's not a bad move here, provided that you're ready to play this sort of thing. Um... But, um, no. He said, I want to fight. So, yeah, this this got interesting. Um, probably not my opening of choice as black. Um, yes, yeah, we're going to Grunfeld Town. And, um... I've maybe over the board, well, no, okay, I've played a, an enormous amount in Blitz as black. Um, I've played it in tournament games maybe two or three times as black. And here I am facing a slightly lower rated player than myself. 
He knows my rating. He must have prepared for this event. Um, he, his coach knows my repertoire. And yet, he plays this anyway. Um... You like it when the knight's on f3. It's an advantage for black. Yeah, you're probably right. Um, that ideally that knight does belong on f2. Um, my rating, you can find on Lee Chess here. Um, it's, uh, what was it? 1950 USCF, 2000 FIDE. So, his coach knows that I play this as the black pieces. Could have maybe given the student a hint if the student had asked. I I just don't get it. On the other hand, um, both in Blitz... Well, no, I have actually played this like a few times in Blitz as white. So... Yeah... I have played this as in Blitz. This is my first over the board like tournament game where it's not a Blitz tournament, but I'm actually playing this. This is kind of an adventure. Um but I, I was just really blown away by my opponent's brash choice of opening here. When there's so many other things he could have played, I gave him an opportunity to not go for this. I delayed knight c3 in the hopes that we get some sort of King's Indian, which I also have played as black. Um, but I also gave him the opportunity to like, transpose into other things. But yeah, we ended up Grinfeld, right? c5. Rook b1. Now, I'll say that I've played the Grinfeld um, with the black pieces quite a bit, and done so in a way that pretty much just agitates my opponent as much as possible. Um, I've not really focused too heavily on what their moves are, and just focused on where are my pieces located. Uh, in the days leading up to this tournament, I did look this up. I have played some Blitz games, and I saw that Rook B1... Uh, is totally a thing that is expected of white and that white shouldn't really be afraid of a potential this bishop f5 hitting the rook because that pawn doesn't move from e4 um, so this is well even if the bishop did move uh, black would have to deal with uh, this threat first so yeah this is not really a thing um, oops how do I get that arrow to disappear? Yeah, rook b... No, you're right. Rook b1 is the main line. Like I said, as black, I've not really paid much attention to what white's doing. I just pay attention to, like, can I move my bishop to g4? Can I move my queen to c7, my knight to c6? Can I castle? I just... Like, it's... I've played this pretty half-heartedly as black. Um... Which is crazy, considering how theoretical it is. But my over-the-board style tends to be get a very, very chaotic position where theory doesn't matter, and then just out-calculate my opponent. Um, which is like the most exhausting exercise in the book. So I've been trying to pick up some openings, but it's pretty bold of me to go into a Grunfeld and only have the vaguest of ideas how to play it as white. Uh, admittedly, so if we go back a bit, like back here, I could have just played knight c3, and like you're saying, the knight could have gone to e2 instead. Um, had I known that we were going to go into a Grunfeld, um, and that we're not, say, transposing into um, some other sort of opening with, like, c5 or c6 um which very well could happen here too so in general i'm playing knight f3 here but yeah we're playing oh never mind back to rook b1 yeah 
So, yeah, I fully expected black to just castle here. Um, in which case, I just play bishop e2 and castle myself, and I'm okay. So that was the extent of my prep, is that I'm just going to play rook b1, bishop e2, and castle. And everything's going to work itself out. And my opponent plays queen c7. Um, and after the game, uh, the TD and I looked at this, and I was saying, well, I was really concerned at this point, because I this is my first game, my first tournament game where I'm playing a Grinfeld as white. And here we are on move eight, and my opponent's deviated. Um, and I've seen plenty of Grinfeld games, I've never seen this idea before. And myself being the higher rated player in this situation, I feel a little bit of pressure that, well, what if my opponent has seen something somewhere in some book or some magazine or some online article or who knows where they got this idea from? They might have some trick that I've really got to worry about. Um, so this had me really concerned. Now, I will say, uh, I tend to play better when I'm really worried. I tend to calculate very accurately when you've given me something to worry about. It's possibly not Black's best move in the book. Um, the most sane thing to do here would just be complete my development. Just don't worry about the queen being there. The queen's not really well situated to threaten anything. This vacating of the d8 square doesn't offer Black any advantage, but that requires having some knowledge and experience, which at the time I did not have. So I responded. I responded that, okay, you're protecting your b-pawn, you're doing something on the queen side, which I've never seen before. I'm going to play something which looks sane to me, um, exploring the fact that you really can't hit my queen. Um, you can't do queen a5 check anymore, or you can't like menace that sort of idea. And I'm now starting to threaten things. I don't know. I, I developed my queen. The one thing I missed out on here was just simply bishop e2 and castling, or bishop d3 and castling. What I was thinking was that, well, I'm not sure where the rest of my pieces go, but in this formation, it looks very good for me to put the queen on the open B file, where um, it controls a lot of squares, and I might get some shot in on F7 at some point. And I'm even threatening bishop C4. So if my opponent continues to dally, I think I did calculate something at this point. Oh, but yeah, after the game, the tournament director and I were looking through a database and seeing that this has been played before very rarely um and so obviously black can't do uh knight c6 because of d5 and that's just um set up the pieces play another game at that point um it's not that bad but this is still it's not a position you want to see this is not what black bargained for you might be able to survive it uh, c3 does hang so maybe that's not it but I forget. Knight c6. Um, I f we found something wrong with this. What was it? Was it indeed just pushing d5? No, just white castles. Um, so we don't need we don't need d5 here. Let's promote that up one. D5 is not a thing. And white successfully put the bishop on a good square threatening uh, to play d5 soon. Black, I don't know, if black really gets careless and plays bishop g4, then I think white just piles on more pressure on the c6 knight, and it's just decisive. Uh, d5, a6. Um, you break the pin, and okay, black doesn't want to hang the knight anymore, but even with, oh, this, yeah, we're not even damaging the pawn structure. 
So White has a comfortable space advantage, but I don't think that's how I would have played it. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. We were trying to bust this line, and maybe we didn't find a way to bust it. But it looked super scary and requires black to play actively. And playing actively, if you play the wrong move, can often um, hurt quite a bit. So, yeah, I just opted to develop to a sensible square here. Even though this doesn't seek to punish what black did, it... Uh, well, it only does if he just completely negates development. I'm trying to force him to play pawn e6 so his bishop can't move. So, how do I draw this? Yeah. Um, so, black plays knight c6. Which uh, caused me to recalculate bishop c4 here. Um... Again, I was looking at, well, I could hit this, and there might be tactical opportunities even after knight a5. I spent quite a bit of time calculating this. Uh, I didn't know this theory. Queen b3 is not the most active developing move on the board. Um, again, just developing with bishop e2 and castle would be perfectly sane thing to do. White would be just a-okay, nothing to worry about. Instead, I see that my d-pawn is threatened. So I'm like, okay, fine. I'll spend some time shoring that up. And again, if the c8 bishop moves, I just take on b7. And everything's hunky-dory. So okay, he liquidates, which actually strengthens my center. Although now my rook on b1 looks slightly misplaced, and would prefer to be on c1. Um, but that's okay. We can deal with that. Uh, so he does castle. And now I get on with my plan of just castling and developing and enjoying a nice space advantage. Um, which I'm doing here. I'm having a great time enjoying this. And then he plays bishop e6. And my reaction was, oh, well... Of all the games I've played and I've seen in the Grinfeld, I've not seen this idea. And what you're saying is that what Black does is he normally goes for a2. But if I remember right, the White Queen usually ends up on a3. Or sometimes ends up there. There's some like lines where White plays Queen a3 to keep black's queen at bay, and also the queen on a3 is quite effective. Um, here, tactically, oh, what was it? Uh, white, or sorry, black is threatening two things here. Bishop takes pawn, as well as, like, bishop c4 or knight c4 ideas. So, hey, welcome. So yeah, what we're looking at here is um, Black's threatening some things, and I was just completely taken aback by how unconditional these moves were. This knight a5, this queen c7, uh, the liquidating on d4 so early in the game, and now putting the bishop in front of the e-pawn. Um... Because uh, I enjoy music. A uh, bit of a connoisseur of some sorts. Uh, but yeah, here we are. Black has played some really provocative moves. And had I played slightly more accurately and saved the tempo, instead of playing bishop e3, if I just played bishop e2 in castle, I would be just winning the game by now. Um... But I had to make things complicated, because that's my style, apparently. Um, so, rook c1 it is. Uh, this stops any piece from going to c4, because I've got one, two, three pieces hitting that square. And, yeah, he's got three attacking it as well. Um, so... 
I had to count that out a few times because I couldn't believe that my opponent would go for this. I mean, I could believe that he didn't see rook c1. But uh, it just seems strange that he makes this one move threat to snap my a pawn. And now look, I've got the c file. Um, actually, let's not do an arrow. Let's just color all the squares that I control. I control this, 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 um, d6, b4, e7, a4, a5. I guess the green doesn't show up so well on green, but it'll show up for those people looking at the analysis afterward. Um, yeah, white controls basically, and this is, I mean, let's not even count squares on my half of the board. So my square count on the opponent's side of the board is 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. I control 12 on the opponent's side. Control in a very loose term that just I'm attacking it. They attack 1, 2, 3, 4. So I've got like an enormous oh wait no five six i don't care about six at the moment um i still got an enormous uh, six square space advantage here um which you would think there would be some easy way to counter just by like black putting a rook on an open file or not stuffing his queen on his back row but um, turns out there's no real easy way for black to deal with all this. Um, this also surprised me. So, literally, well, not any other move, but here's just a few things to consider. Okay, so the most obvious thing to consider doesn't quite work out. It's rook c8. Um, eh, I think in the worst possible case, I could always play d5 in castle to get out of this. I could consider like d5 and knight to d2 to deal with this threat. Um, so that's one thing to worry about. Another idea here would be b5, which um, actually does not work in this position. Um, I don't need to draw an arrow and a circle. I can just take it. Um, and yeah, that's about the extent of what black can do here. Um, noting that like queen d6, um, yeah, it's just really difficult for black to develop. I mean, he could play b6 and then threaten to move the queen forward to attack my queen, and then you give himself an isolated pawn. Um, assuming I take it, and maybe I don't. How do I look at these pieces? Well, when you've been playing online chess for at least 15 years using 2D pieces, you get tired of it after a while, so that's how I put up with these. These are decent pieces too. The, the contrast between the pieces and the board isn't that great, but of all the ones I've experimented with, this seems to work the best. Um, but, yeah. So we got bishop g4. Uh, I finally can uh, complete my development here. And, yeah, since he's moved his bishop away from the attack of this square, like moved it over here uh, I'm not so worried about knight c4 happening and if knight c4 isn't happening this is going to be very very difficult for black to unwind from now bear in mind this entire time like I'm thinking my goodness my opponent he's known with my repertoire he has a coach I, I mean I wasn't thinking about that I didn't know that I should have known that but this coach knows my openings and must have prepared some sort of nasty surprise for me. Because why else would you play a Grinfeld against an expert? I 
Mm, I don't know. It's not a comfortable opening to play, so you better have prepared it if you're going to play it. Or you pick something a little bit less aggressive. Just temper it just a little bit. Play something you're comfortable with and familiar with that you've played before. Or use this as a learning experience. I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe this was just a learning experience for my opponent. Okay, so he did play knight c6. And so I'm figuring, well, gosh, I've got something that's almost a hanging pawn center, but not quite. But, like, I've got two bishops, and they can't go very far. So temporarily, he's got kind of a nice bind on my position. But converting that into any lasting initiative or advantage just doesn't work that well. I was considering just an exchange sacrifice on c6, because I get so much play for it. But I don't even have to sack right now. Like, if ever I need to sack, I can do that. But I don't even need to do it here. I just... Um, I saw that my d4 pawn was attacked three times and defended once. So this is like his big climax that he's built up to over the last 17 moves that he's threatening the d-pawn. Um, so you got my bishop defending it, but he's got one, two, three hitting it. So I was considering, like, do I sack on c6, which would give me a lot of pressure, which would allow me to play e5 and keep the bishop out for a while. It, I did look at this. It didn't quite seem good enough. Um, or, I mean, yeah, I've got pressure over here, pressure over there. I'm keeping this bishop at bay because, like, I'm threatening this square, so that's mine. Um, I've got my bishop going in, but this isn't enough play. I, um, my bishops can't really do anything. In particular, my dark square bishop doesn't work that well with my dark squared pawns. If I had a knight, maybe a knight on e3 um, could function much more effectively than a bishop there. Um, assuming I'm don't, not dropping d4 outright. And maybe I could have gone for this. Um, but no. Instead, I just uh, push my d-pawn, which gets a nice space advantage. And... Yeah. Yeah, I'm focused very heavily on tactics, because unfortunately I don't know the strategy behind, well, I mean, this sort of stuff here. Like, we've deviated so far from book at this point. There, none of the pieces are on their normal squares. So, yeah, I did try a whole bunch of things, but, um, yeah, I just couldn't figure out, like, what to do against something so unorthodox by my opponent. I think the answer is that I shouldn't have chickened out and played bishop e3 back here. Um, that, like, okay, I see there's three things hitting my c, or d pawn, um, but I've got so many things I can consider here. Um, one of which is just take the pawn. I thought about this, and I'm like, I don't see why not to do this, other than I just have no idea what's going on in this position. And so I chickened out, I defended my d-pawn, but like I could have maybe gotten away with e5, with maybe d5? I doubt the d5 works, because he's got knight e5. This doesn't seem that great for white, but white's build up kind of initiative here, so you could maybe check here, and if the bishop moves, then there's pressure against this b pawn. Um, now, granted, the c pawn is hanging at all the end of this, so that might not be the greatest idea in the world, and I don't like this particularly much. Um, let's get rid of bishop b5. We don't need that here. But, I mean, there's so much I could consider here. Um, I just couldn't figure out what to do. I think the answer, though, is, like I've been saying, just bishop e2, and assume black castles, and assume white castles, and just play a game.
And it's a game where blacks put his pieces on bad squares. Um, now, I don't know if you just sack the pawn outright. Um, and this could be an argument. Yeah, I don't know. Bishop e2. Can you just take this? Is this better for black even? So white has to recapture. And apparently black's best is just to do bishop takes pawn, according to Stockfish. And I know this is a tactical position. I know there's a lot of... But why not something like bishop g4 here? Is this so terrible? I wasn't going to try to figure this out um, in the relatively short time control that we had. I know I, I mentioned this is 90 plus 30, but the Grinfeld's a really difficult opening to solve over the board. So I'm not sure I would have figured this all out, but um, apparently, just the way my opponent played it, I'm doing just fine. If I find all this. If I don't find all this and I went for this sort of thing, then maybe my center completely falls apart and I lose the game in the most embarrassing fashion ever. But yeah, this bishop e2 is the thematic thing to do here, I think. Now, I don't think that's the engine's preference. I think the engine prefers... I just push d5 here. Um, and then on knight a5, I just run back and I've got a good position. But I don't actually like this very much. Um, I fragmented my center a little bit. My opponent could play e6 at some point. But I'm not subjecting myself to a bishop g4 pin either. Uh, this is a local tournament. Um, the time control was 90 plus 30. Um, sorry, I'm not going to go into too much detail on the location there. Um, a yeah, local TD had arranged a tournament uh, that has six experts in it. It's a nine round round robin. Um, this was not one of the experts though. So yeah, um, we've deviated so far from book. I could understand him not seeing Rook C1 just shutting down his knight. And then once the queen has gone back, I've also shut down his bishop and threatening his knight. And it's just very difficult for black to move around. And I I was surprised to see this, honestly. Like, that pin's always going to be there. Um, I'm not going to have a good way to break the pin. I mean, yes, I could move the bishop at the expense of ruining my pawn structure, but this is complicated. Instead, he gives me a position where I have a space advantage and the bishop pair. Uh, for He's got a one-move threat, which I dealt with. He's got a one-move threat to ruin my pawn structure again. Um, let's do it with a red arrow, which I deal with again. And so it's around this point in the game that I'm realizing, you know, maybe my opponent doesn't have this prepared. How does queen a3 stand? Um, it's funny, yeah, the uh, TD and I looked at this afterward and didn't think very much of queen a3. So, the best move here is uh, d5, and then I just castle. And this knight is just totally off sides, there was no need to go for queen a3. But your question is about queen a3, just how is it? Well, so the top move by the engine was given a point eight. This is given like 0.5. Uh, Black does get to complete his development here. I do get to transpose with like playing d5. Um, but my pieces have to retreat a little bit. And I get to castle. Oh, why not castle here? Do I have enough initiative that like I can just ignore castling? And then we hit this. This seems really weird. Why would, why would you repeat like this if you're trying to win? Does the engine know that this is a repetition? I don't think the engine knows. Um, and I think the TD and I looked at this with um, Fritz, and it came to the same repetition as well. But I don't know. 
I think I can prune this after um, there. So, yeah, I just don't know what's really going on there in terms of if I do everything the engine suggests. Um, I don't think I would. I think I would just castle here. Oh, I'm sorry, D5 first. Why D5? Oh, D5 stops, yeah, C4 invasion. Um, I still think I would castle. Just chicken out a little bit. And, yeah, I think I'm fine. I mean, this is a half pawn advantage um, with queen a3, as opposed to what the best move here was, which was d5, before black has a chance to do rook c8, um, and even start to menace knight c4. Yeah, I think the one thing, though, like, from a human perspective, that like makes queen a3 really alluring is that I'm attacking e7, I'm attacking a5, I'm defending a2. This is a very difficult position for black to find a constructive plan in. Um, and he actually erred immediately, in my opinion, with bishop g4. And my opinion is that, yeah, rook c8 is where black should go with this. Um, although I think if rook c8, I don't play d5. I think I play this castle. Well, I'll play it pretty soon, regardless of when I play it. I have to play d5 immediately to stop knight c4, but once I get to castle here, let's promote that up one. Um, yeah, white's okay. Um, in fact, this has the same evaluation as the queen a3 line, but um, I don't think it's necessary to play queen a3. I don't think it loses anything either, because black's position's so terrible. It's a good uh, waiting move. Um, was this tournament on the third? Uh, I think so. Wait, no. No, it wasn't. So, yeah, here we are. My opponent plays knight c6. I go deal with that. And, and around here I'm realizing my opponent's making a whole bunch of one-mover threats. And I'm thinking, you know, all this fear I had that my opponent's prepared something is more than a bit unjustified. Um, I think at this point I had um, maybe 60 minutes to my opponent's 70 or something like that. I think I was a bit down on the clock, but not too much. And, um, yeah, around here my opponent was starting to slow down. And I was actually starting to speed up and get some momentum, because, like, I've shut down all of my opponent's plans, and now I can just threaten whatever I want to do. And it falls to my opponent to go try to defend against everything I come up with. It's just, like, I mean, some people have talked about the Rui Lopez as being the Spanish torture, this very much falls in that vein, that it's just very difficult for black to make moves here without immediately conceding material. So he plays another slow move. Um, I would say that this is a one mover threat, except it's actually a two mover. He's threatening to play b5 and knight c4. Very clever. Not very subtle, but yeah, as long as I'm taking a second to figure out like what he's up to, it's pretty clear to me what I have to do. Especially considering that I have a space advantage, and his knight's currently sitting on an outpost, and if I kick said knight, it has nowhere forward to go. This was a pretty simple decision. Now, it's very committal in the sense that, oh no... I have an e-pawn, he in theory might be able to get some sort of piece to attack that e-pawn. Um, wouldn't that be terrible? But, um, you know, around this point I just got fed up with doing defensive, cowardly moves. And figured I could get a really nice space advantage this way. Yeah. Now, granted, if I'd known more Grunfeld theory, 
there's probably some Grunfeldish way to say, you know, you got your knight on e5, I don't care. I'm going to develop all my pieces around it and continue increasing my space advantage um, without risking having a backward e-pawn. And it's not technically backward at this point, but at this point I can't play f3 to defend e4 either. Um, I mean, ideally... I would still have the rook on b1, and I could play bishop b6, and like there's nothing for me to worry about then. But this is slightly more complicated. Um, yeah, I just complete my development. Say, so, okay, fine. You're going to play b5. I can't stop you. I'm just going to embrace it and try to activate all my pieces, maximize my space advantage, and see if you hang anything. Um... And if you don't hang anything, I'm just going to continue trying to increase my space advantage with, like, I don't know, queen b4, a4, e5, g4, h3 maybe, I don't know. g4 is a bit pushing it, but it's difficult to come up with anything constructive for black. He did get his bishop onto the long diagonal. He was really proud of that. Um... But he'd given up everything else in the world to get that. Um, so I've got a bishop pair. Um, it'd be kind of nice to transfer this bishop onto b3. And then I'd have threats on f7. And then I could actually throw the king's side forward and just try to mate him. Um, but yeah, it's, I'm not sure what black's supposed to do. But looking at this... Um, I pretty quickly concluded that that's not it. Um, so, yes, rooks do belong in open files. I did calculate rook takes rook and queen takes pawn. Um, and just realized that he gets a lot of play if I do this. Like, if I actually go pawn grabbing, um, that hurts. So this is the downside of having an e-pawn that's not defended. Okay, so then I thought, well, do I have any, like, waiting moves I could chuck in here? Like, can I just do e5? And then threaten to take it. And no, it's not that good. Okay, can I do, I don't know, bishop f3? And then go ahead and, no. I mean, there's nothing I can really do. Um, I mean, even if e5, you could still consider this, but he has better ways to deal with this, I think. Um, yeah, rookie eight's no good there. What was it that I was looking at here, though? Rook takes rook. Queen takes. Oh, it is rookie eight. Um, but what about e6? Oh, right, right. So I saw this. And I'm like, yeah, I don't like this. This is no fun. I can press a space advantage forever. I don't need to give him um, satisfaction of like breaking up my pawn center. How's d6? Um, are you talking about immediately here on move 22? That's an interesting thought. I think he takes. I don't think I get very much for it. Um. But maybe you're referring to some other move order here, where I get better. Um, okay, well my guess is pawn takes pawn. What does Stockfish think? Probably rook takes rook. Oh wow. That's ballsy. So okay, I get some initiative. I get to play rook c1. Look at my rook, it's on an open file. Hooray! And then f5? I guess this does keep the bishop out of play. Like, rook c7 doesn't seem to go very far. It hits a pawn, but black gets to take on f4. So you want to play this, but... Um, I mean, it's playable. It's a thing. It doesn't look very fun. I mean, yeah, it's good for white, but surely white's got better, right? Why push pawns when you can just keep improving your pieces 
Oh, queen takes d6. I'm sorry. Um, so d6, pawn takes, queen takes. And I assume he takes the rook, just because this simplifies his life to not have to deal with this pressure. And he plays this rook on the open file. And you probably had something in mind here. I don't see what it is. Maybe it's rook c7. Although he could just move the knight. Um, what if we do rook c7 and try to win this outright? Okay. Oh, I don't win a pawn because e4 is loose. Yeah, I guess the one thing I like drew from um, just our opening play, the one conclusion I reached, is that my opponent likes making simple threats. Like, he's got this move, I'm going to move a piece to c4, and he's got this, I'm going to try liquidating the center. And so you have to realize, like, none of these tactics are going to work out, because he's calculated them all. It's all he calculates are just tactics. And so I get away with things like pawn f4, just kicking the knight, with rook d1. And here I just play bishop g4. It's just another waiting move. Yeah, you're right, though. I mean, sure, it's fine. It's okay. But... My opponent is so fixated on tactics, because he's played a Grunfeld, that um, maybe he just didn't adjust well to the fact that like, we still have a positional chess game to get resolved here as well. Um, again, he's just got to liquidate and try to keep trading pieces, because he doesn't have anything else here. I've taken away every square every one of his pieces can move to, basically. Um, so it's very difficult for black to make a move that doesn't immediately self-destruct. Um, uh, I mean, yes. Well, the other thing is, like, I was trying to manage my time in this game. Um, my opponent was burning a lot of time trying to find some sort of tactic to just get him out of the opening with some sort of equality or advantage. And I'm, um, so since move 17 here... I'm just thinking, you know, I'm just going to play some practical moves. I mean, d5 is good. Bishop e2, sure, why not? I mean, maybe bishop d1's better, I don't know. f4, yeah, sure. So I'm kind of blitzing the moves at this point. Not entirely, but... I'm like, yeah, bishop g4, sure, that looks fine. What's he going to do? Yeah, well, I think this does squeeze him, too. Yeah. I think, yeah, okay, there might be some tactical justification somewhere in that, uh, all those variations, but I don't have to find it. That's not the goal of the game. The goal is just to win. Um, unless you're like Mikhail Tall or Paul Morphy or Bobby Fischer or something like that, um, Gary Kasparov. You know, you're like one of those folks that needs to find the best move. Um, no, the goal is just to play well. Um, and I was looking forward to, after the game, seeing, like, how this stacks up against other games that have been played by, um, well, players below expert, by experts, by national masters, and even at higher levels, if any grandmasters or international masters have played this. Um, and... I guess what I discovered afterward is that usually black does a better job activating his pieces, because otherwise the space advantage is just um, horrifying. But also I got a better sense of just what can and can't black get away with in terms of um, just trying to win a pawn in the opening or trying to prevent white from castling. Yeah, I mean this was Friday night. Um, this was uh, potentially going to go very late into the evening. Um, so it's not like there was some other round uh, the same day. There, there was a round the next morning. But in terms of that, you, you do want to try to finish the game 
um, in as few moves as possible and just get it over with. Uh, win, loss, or draw. Um, but, oh, okay. Uh, I hit the keyboard by accident. But, um, but yeah, here I was just focused on just trying to play good moves and seeing if I could get anything that even modestly resembled any position I might recognize. Uh, I did realize that after I played bishop g4, or even before I played it, immediately before, like, I think I sat for several minutes trying to find anything um, that wasn't risky that I could play that was better. And bishop g4 seemed like a pretty common sense move that uh, I did see that he had this h5 opportunity, and I concluded there's no way he's going to play this. This just exposes Black's king too much. Like, for all the other things that are wrong about Black's position, um, it would be a super ballsy move to throw h5 into the mix. Um, considering all the other pieces are on the first two ranks, he's already pushed a pawn in front of his king, and he spent a move playing a6, and he's given White the bishop pair. I figured there's no way. Um, but no, uh, h5 does attempt to resolve things through tactical means, so at least my opponent is consistent. He's trying to prevent me from getting some sort of obliterating tech on him. So, okay. He doesn't like this pressure. This is actually a sensible move. It just means that after this move, he's got to be really, really careful, because... He's making it much easier for me to pry open the king's side and checkmate him. Yeah, my king is certainly more vulnerable. I've um, I've already played f4. I don't have a knight to support my king. Um, my second rank is wide open. If he could just get a rook over there. This diagonal approaching the king is wide open. If he could just get any piece onto that diagonal. So yeah, I'm... I think I am more vulnerable than he is, but this starts to shift things slightly the other direction. Uh, but you're you're absolutely right that yeah. So I was quite concerned at this point. Um, this is just an over the board game I played um, not too long ago. So I'm like, okay, fine. You're going to prevent me from putting my or keeping my bishop on g4. I will say that back here, I did consider just playing bishop f3 and not allowing or not encouraging h4, but I actually preferred uh, the game position here um, with this pawn this far extended. I guess I'm really not afraid of him like pushing all his kingside pawns forward and checkmating me there. I'm not even too afraid of him putting a knight on g4 because I could just play h3 to prevent that. So, uh, <laughs> speaking of which, um, yeah, I could just play h3 to prevent that too, but I'm just like, you know, okay, why would I even bother preventing that when it's not that great of a move to begin with? Now, he does want to do this two-move threat, knight g4 and f5. He'd finally get to push a pawn in the center of the board, maybe get something going. Um, but I'm like, no, we're not going to let that happen today. I'm just going to hit your e-pawn. And so I've just been dancing around his pieces this whole game, and I have the bishop pair. Okay, my king is a bit drafty. And if I could just somehow centralize and consolidate my pieces, I can make another push forward. Um, this is not the most pleasant position for white ever, but, you know, it's good enough. Um, yeah, you can find this rating on Lee Chess. Um, I'm 1950 USCF and 2000 FIDE. So, um, this is my first tournament game in a very long time. Uh, again, for those who missed the beginning. Um... 
I've been playing a lot of blitz chess, both over the board and online. But getting back into the swing of things, I was really cautious this game. I think that might have been a factor as well. I'm just trying to make sure I don't miss something critical and that I manage my time properly and start getting some good habits going again. Um, so here I'm just playing practical moves in an opening that I don't see very... Well, I've played it as black. I have a better, much better idea how to play it as black, and I, the way I play it deviates heavily from the way theory dictates it be played. Um, so I tend to get really out of book positions uh, as black, and I tried to get something in book this game, but my opponent just deviated on move 8. So what can you do? But, yeah, so he sees that he can just go defend this pawn. And, um, where was it that I saw this? It wasn't here. Was it here, or was it here, or was it back here? It's not here. Okay. This is where I saw the combination that came up in the game. Um, I had considered h3 as a candidate move, and then I saw, well, no, I've got... Um, I've got a space advantage. I've got a development advantage. Surely I can finally make something of this now that he's moving his piece like 85 times in the opening. Um, this knight, where did this knight come from? This knight went... Knight... Um, let's see. This knight went... Uh, yeah, went to c6, went to a5, back to c6... Tried to get it to a4. That didn't quite work out. Then went to e5 and then back to d7 and now to f6. Um, and he's going to move his knight to g4. And I guess I will say in uh, his favor here, like, yeah, a knight's a tricky piece. You could probably beat most people just moving the knight around. Um... Yeah, so it was around here where he played knight f6 where I'm like, I saw this, I saw this tactic, and the point of it all um, is that suppose that we get like rook takes, um, I could do rook takes rook and take back, and I've won an exchange. Point number two, queen takes. Um, and yeah, then I can do, uh, queen takes queen, and again, I win an exchange. So, two very important points. Point number three is that I have Tempe to, like, play d6, um, and not hang my e-pawn after all this. Um... And throwing in this move, I don't think helped him. Well, no, that doesn't help either. Because I'm attack. Well, oh, I'm sorry. No, what I thought would continue in the game would be rook takes rook. Bishop takes queen. Rook takes d1. Bishop takes d1. Rook takes d8. Uh, I thought the game would actually continue this way. Because he does get quite a bit of activity here. Um, but, no, it's just no good for black. So, I saw all three of these uh, lines, as well as what proceeded in the game, which was option number four, which I just shut down with bishop c5. So I've collected the pawn, I've still got a really awesome center, and at this point, yeah, um, wait, you say queen e7 somewhere, at the end of the final line we were just looking at? Okay, queen e7. I don't think I calculated this far. Um, or if I did, I saw a rook e8. Um, and if I take here, I think knight takes, and he's threatening bishop d4. Let's put the other color arrow on the board. So, yeah, I... I Again, collecting, or there's not even a pawn to take there anymore, but it's just stuff to watch out for. Um, 
Yeah, so I play on Lee Chess as Toad of Sky or Todovsky. Um, so that's where you can find me there. I don't take direct challenges and such. Uh, so, what do we got? See, so yeah, I saw all this, and I wasn't so sure about Queen E7 here, but I saw I could shore things up with um, Bishop to F3. And there's just nothing at all for white to worry about. I mean, okay, black could play knight g4, white just takes it. And even if white's got something better than just going into this, even this is still pretty strong. Okay, so he's able to hit my pawn, right? But, I mean, this is just speculation. And even this speculation, shallow as it is, is very encouraging for white. Ah, I wish I could. Um, my chat device is not hooked up to uh, my computer, so I don't have a way to copy that. Um, sorry about that. So, yeah, what this means is that... Um, oh, where were we? How did we get to this? Oh, so I saw queen b6, and I just played bishop c5 here. And I've just completely shut down his attack. He's got difficulty developing anything here. And this just keeps putting nails in the coffin. Um, where, like, it's pretty clear he's tried to resolve a lot of things through tactical means and now realizing that there's just no tactics left. Ah, okay, yeah, I can type my username. Uh, we can do that. So you can find my study on there. Try not to spoil everything for everybody else. Um, Alright, so yeah, he's trying to develop his bishop. I shut down the bishop. Um, Oh, he's intending a pretty obvious knight move. So, again, to recap, this knight has gone to basically every square on his half of the board. I don't remember. Has this knight ever gone past the sixth rank? Oh, wait, no, it did go to a5 once. Um, yeah, that knight has never left his half of the board. Interesting. So, I prevent knight c4, um, but also, hey look, a skewer! Finally! A freaking tactic other than just winning the pawn, which had a really complicated continuation there. But finally, we've got a tactic that's, like, really simple. And this gives black no option or recourse other than exchanging queens. And hey look, I've still got a bishop pair. And his knight's got to retreat again. And so, oh. So this sets up a threat, right? So he's got this pin, which means the a5 is attacked. And you can do knight takes e5 and say neener neener. And, um, yeah. I'll say back here is where I saw king f2 at the end of all of this. Um, um, and black just doesn't have any initiative. I've defended my e3 bishop. He's got pressure. Uh, my e3 bishop's a bad bishop, but uh, I have a really nice space advantage. So we just play chess. And I tried to find some tactical means to just win the game instantly and couldn't find anything, so I just played g3. Okay, we'll play another move. Okay, and I tried to um, again, I couldn't find any, like, decisive invasion with rook c7. I calculated a lot, didn't seem to work. Um, I started calculating things like e6 and f5 and rook c6 and rook c7, and just in this labyrinth of all these variations did not see anything that encouraging. So I'm like, okay, I'll just collect a pawn. Um... Seeing that if he plays something like rook c2, I just drop my bishop back. So. Um, 
the most accurate thing he could have done here, in my opinion, would have been knight c5. Where, okay, this actually does start to get a bit complicated. Um, so he's hitting my rook. He's hitting my pawn. He's threatening knight d3 and rook c2 and stuff. So there's actually a whole lot going on here. I'm blanking as to what my analysis was here. I think it was rook c6. And the point is that irrespective of all these tactics, um, they're on the board here. I've got a pretty simple tactical resolution that like forces a rook exchange. Um, oh, I forgot his knights actually attacked here. So I was thinking king e7 or king e8, and that I'd still have a lot of problems. Um, I was imagining something more like this, where it is pretty complicated, or at least more complicated than it needs to be. Um, I forgot that his knight was hanging. That would have helped immensely. Um, so, okay, my opinion's just wrong, and he's just dead lost. Oh, wait, no, 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 I'm confusing my lines here. It wasn't knight c5. Yeah, knight c5, rook c6 is game. No, what I was concerned about is that he'd do an intermezzo first. And not rook c3, but rook c2 is the intermezzo. Um, again, I had intended bishop e2. Then he's got uh, knight c5. And okay, I could skewer him, but I mean, this is starting to get pretty messy with threats of knight d3. And I don't know exactly what follows here. Um, my plan was rook a8 check, uh, if I had to resort to anything to try to get out of this, I've got that recourse. I have, what I don't like to play here is going into an opposite color bishop endgame, but this probably would have been fine as well, or, cause, like, I've got two extra pawns and I'm threatening to win a third, so this is probably okay but not where I'd want to go with this. Um, but no, that's fine. Because I'm threatening, and I did see this during the game, that I have this uh, threat of rook a8 check, and then d7, d8. So he'd have to play like king here. What I missed was the next tempo of this, which is just rook b6. Um, somehow I miscalculated that. This just simply wins the pawn. Without rook b6, though, this could get complicated. Um, but I figured I could probably win this if I had to bail out into it. I also figured, you know, I probably don't have to take the knight. Was I right? Oh, let's put the intermezzo first. So if king e7... Okay, this makes a lot of sense. And then, yeah. Oh, king f3? Why that? Interesting. So my B pawn is hanging. Um, I have to confess I didn't look at this. Leave that as an exercise for the viewer. Um, just how many different ways is white winning this? The answer is probably more than anybody can count. Um, but yeah, probably the thing black has to worry about here is um, white's bishop takes b5 and rook e8 checkmate. Um, checkmate does tend to win the game. Uh, so yeah, this is not so good for black. But there's probably a lot of other nuances in that position. But I figured, worst case, if I couldn't figure out anything else here, I could just take the knight and probably win that even though it's not my preferred endgame. And even though I probably have better... And with, like, the 30-something minutes I had on the clock, if we actually hit this position, I would start calculating and try to find something better. But I was super confident. If I weren't feeling so confident, um, then I would have back here just kept calculating until I find something I'm confident with that I can win. Um, what you're supposed to do is calculate until you see the checkmate. Not really, but calculate until you see something that's just completely winning. And I didn't do that. I was conserving some energy. Um, 
I played what's probably good enough for me to win. But, yeah, looking for a decisive variation would have been an interesting exercise. But I didn't want to try to resolve things through tactical means against this opponent who seems to handle everything through tactics and not understand strategy. Um, so yeah, I played this and I got my strategic uh, resource uh, pawn to b4 in. And this is what I was hoping for. Um, granted, I mean, I think I could have handled the other endgame positions, but um, I was trying to force him into a position where he had to make some difficult decisions. Like, does he play rook c3 or rook c2 or knight c5? Um, and the way he handled this, he played rook c3. But had he tried to handle things with knight c5, like, he sees that I have this immediate rook c6 resource, so he's not going to play knight c5 immediately. But, okay, after rook c2, he's got to be concerned that not only do I have bishop e2, I've got king g1. And I've probably got other moves here, like king f1 is probably fine. I've got king g1, king f1. Um, the point of king f1 is if he takes the h-pawn, I've got bishop g2 trapping the rook. Um, now granted, the rook might probably does get out at some point, but there's just a whole lot of things for black to calculate. And all for naught, because I probably just take the knight anyway, unless I find something better. And if I find something better, then I play the better thing. Sorry if that doesn't make sense. I'm kind of going back and forth and back and forth, justifying some balance between calculating everything and then just calculating enough to get a good position. And I'm saying I could probably calculate and find something better than bishop takes knight. But I wasn't going to bother to do that three or four moves in advance. Especially when we have this practical shot here. And now black just doesn't have anything. Uh, so he tries to resol um, resolve this through tactical means. And misses a tactic. Finally. Like three to four hours into this game, he misses a tactic. Okay, so, uh, and even so, he gets decent material for it. He gets like two pawns and a bishop for the rook. But, I mean, positionally, this is horrifying for black. Um, so I check him, and yeah, finally I get another tactic in on him. Now, this is not the most sound tactic in the book. I think I found some way Black can complicate this. I I was actually calculating this during the game uh, when we got to, even before this position. Where was it that I was looking at this stuff? Where was it? Knight takes c5. I think this is where I found uh, the bishop h5 tactic. Um, no, I'm sorry. It was after... Yeah, was during my opponent's time here, I was looking at um, just how do I improve my position further. Because my opponent is being kind of a stubborn opponent for somebody who should probably have something better to do on a Friday night. Not that I'm holding it against him or anything. No, I'm just making light of the fact that, you know, we've spent like three hours playing this, four hours playing this at this point. He's still not resigning. I've been crushing him the whole game, although I haven't fully understood what's going on either, so it's fair for him to play on, as long as it's not so clear that I know what I'm doing. Um, I think I think he did have some complicated ways to play this. Oh, interesting. Bishop f8. I mean, I thought my opinion was that retreating his bishop was the best try, because I'm not going to sack my bishop for two pawns unless I'm crazy. Um, which maybe I am. I could do that and probably still win it. Um, but no, he goes for the most complicated line. Um, oh, and then after the game, TD pointed out to me, uh, I had something else that was pretty clever here. I have pawn takes, and on pawn takes, I've got king d4. And this would be, like, a beautiful way to end the game. So, yeah, I'm threatening to take the knight. It's got one destination. 
Um, and yeah, that would be game. That would be easier than what happened. Although, by this point, we were both tired. I mean, come on. I did find the bishop takes h5, which was cute. I was proud of it. Probably more proud than I should have been. But uh, this would have really put away the game immediately. Instead, I go, I'm like, okay, fine. You hit my rook, whatever. I'm going to take your pawn. Oh no, you're attacking my rook. I'm just going to ignore you. You check me. Okay, I'm not going to go after the knight. And at this point, he finally throws on the towel and is like, yeah, okay, fine. You win. Good enough. Um, so yeah, that was my return to tournament chess. Um, I think my opponent did really well calculating this game. Um, although the tactic that he missed in the middle, maybe he missed something in this third variation where rook takes c1, bishop takes, rook takes, and then the key is that I have bishop takes um, on d1. Um, otherwise, this variation comes to naught. Like, if I'm losing a rook, this is pretty terrible. Um, but I'm not forced to capture on c1 immediately, so maybe this is what he missed. But more generally speaking, the fact that he moved this knight from b8 um, way too many times. Probably didn't help him very much. So, it was an okay return to tournament chess. You know, I kind of hoped for a little bit better on my part. Although, I've been pretty rusty too. So, not a bad way to start the tournament with a win. That's game one. Game two. I get the black pieces uh, against John Porter. I believe won his first round game. Um, yeah, so we were both sitting on... This is a nine round round robin. We've played half of it this far. Um, and we both got off to a one, um, one win, no draws, no losses lead. So we're both one for one here. He opens e4. So I'm relieved because this is um, the repertoire I've played for quite a bit as black. Um, and what I've played once, I've played a thousand times here, is bishop c5. And, you know, I figured I'm playing in a tournament with strong players. I want to learn something. But also, I want to practice playing something other than bishop c5 every game. Because then they play d3. And they play the Gioco Pianissimo, and it's the most boring nonsense ever. Um, and I could sense my opponent was playing very quickly. He was in quite a rush after I'd started the clock. He was just banging out his moves. Like, he was very tense during the game. Um, so I could tell that this guy was a very tactical fellow, that it was very important to him that he had every second on his clock. Which made me think, okay, it seems like a guy who wants to try to win the game through making it very complicated, very tactical. Doesn't really care um, one way or the other about trying to play a slower positional, um, much more reflective, I don't know. So he's looking to bash me off the board. But he'd also probably play the pianissimo if he could have it, since that's the popular thing these days. So I play the two knights. And there we are, d3. I've had quite a few tournament games where I've played d5 here with mixed results. Um, I just didn't want to see d5 again. I figure, you know, it's about time that... Um, I try to learn how to play games without trying to win everything through tactics. I've played bishop c5 and knight f6 and other positions. Um, so, without playing d5, I try to figure, well, what can I do to continue my development and try to get a reasonable position? So now he castles. And, you know, in hindsight, um, 
Well, no, actually what I played is just fine. Never mind. D5 is still on the table. I could still play it if I really wanted to. But my king's in the center and it's not so pleasant. Um, so there it is. The Piedissimo. C3, D3. But this time I don't have my bishop on C5, so I don't have to worry about um, some of the nonsense which occurs in lines where my bishop is not able to get back and defend my f6 knight. So this is a lot more solid than what I usually get. Um, TD pointed out after the game with a database we were looking at together, I just play knight a5 here. Or even if not here, like in a variety of positions, I just play this. And this is just very pleasant for black. Um, so there's no need to, I mean, I was saying that, okay, if I win the bishop pair, it's not a very great position. Or even if I don't win the bishop pair, like if he plays bishop d5, I play, oh, I miscalculated this. Somehow I didn't think that I got his bishop, but I do get it. But I've played this sort of thing before, and it's not very pleasant either. Um, but no, I learned that this sort of c5 thing is not something that just happens in the Rui. It's also quite possible... Um, actually, this is the wrong line in which to do it. Never mind. Never mind. You don't need to go there. a4, and then this is the position where this is worth considering. And, okay, white stops bishop g5. That's a good play by white. But we get something that's like a Chigorin, um, but without all the hassle that comes with that. Black is able to just quickly re-mobilize his pieces through the center, because white doesn't have all the center pressure that comes from playing uh, knight d2. White doesn't have bishop g5. White's actually behind a tempo because he spent it on a4. So, yeah, black is doing fine here. But I'm not so familiar with this stuff. So anyway, we proceed a5. And like a dope, I play a6. And I say that um, with greatest affection here because I figure there's no way my opponent's going to go for this nonsense with trying to win my b pawn there's no way he's gonna try to like lift his rook and queen over here and surely he's gonna do something reasonable like what most players would do and try to push in the center on the king side and i figured the reason he'd never do this is because i can just take on f3 and what you got i mean i've got a decent king side position and after queen d7, um, yeah, we've got this queen trap if he goes for that, which he won't do. But if he doesn't go for that, what's he going to do here? If he plays f4, I'd probably just take it and put my knight on e5. No, oh, that's fine. We'll come back. Um, yeah, we just enjoyed like a little bit of a Spanish open. Or not a Spanish, but what could have been very similar to a Spanish if I just had the sense to play knight a5 and c5 and take a really large slice of the center and then go back and try to push on the king side. Um, but yeah, instead we get this and he's doubled some of his king side pawns and okay, it says move after I defend my b pawn. Um, but yeah, what's he going to do? He plays king h1 and I I don't know. I don't really want to go through all the tactics that happen in this game. Again, you can find this game on Leech Us. Um, I'll probably remember to link to it in the video on demand. Um, but, yeah, I thought I had a very strong tactical advantage here. And it just didn't materialize. Uh, I thought I had Tempe to play Rook B8 instead of Knight D8. Things just got super complicated. I'm not going to go into all the tactics that happen here. He does stop f5 for a moment, but I get to push f5 anyway. Um, yeah, I saw some really weird stuff this game. He plays d5, which is very good to his credit, but 
he's still got his kingside problems to deal with. Um, so I play f5, and this is... He was saying during the game he was being really clever and delaying this little trap, pin, whatever, and he was so tense about playing it. And when he did play it, okay, yeah, that did make me tense up quite a bit. Because I'm like, well, crap, how do I develop my stuff here? He's threatening to start trading things in the center. And moreover, he's threatening bishop takes f4 in many positions. And I have nothing better than pawn takes bishop. And giving me, uh, giving my position double pawns. And giving him some initiative. Um, so this uh, stops, like... Stuff where bishop takes, I have bishop takes in return. So I'm not messing up my pawn structure. Um, on the other hand, however, he's starting to threaten things like bishop a7, and rook b4, and queen b3, and bishop a6. All of his pieces are targeting the queen side. And, okay... This, uh, this kind of thing is the hallmark of one of my games. This is how you know that it's me playing um, on one side of the board, is that the opponent has a pretty much unstoppable plan, and I just let them do it. I'm like, okay, fine. You want to go fight for every damn thing on the board and just never compromise? Okay, sure. Fine, let's trade stuff. Okay, I'm in a pin. Your move. Okay, so he defends his f pawn. Um, I got a little greedy. I thought I was winning in exchange. This doesn't win in exchange, but it's okay. But I mean, yeah, it's. I still have this lasting weakness on the queen side. I don't have any king side initiative, other than out of this knight h3 thing, which doesn't quite work because like. He's defending his queen, his queen defends f2. If I trade the queens, I still don't get the f2 pawn. But I get this nice knight on f4. So that's fine. Um, at some point, he's got to strongly consider trying to trade to get this knight off the board before I can get my other knight to occupy that square. Um, but we'll see how that goes. Pawn takes pawn. I'm like, oh, yeah, that was the other thing here. So, what was it? What was it? I thought if I did pawn takes pawn, this is somehow very unpleasant for black. Because it's like knight e2. And I don't, I can't get my one knight to support the other knight, so I'm going to get doubled f pawns. And if I can continue defending all my weaknesses, like I've got b7, a6, f5, and what would be f4 is another weakness. And c7 is a weakness, and an open diagonal here to worry about. Um, I've got a lot of positional weaknesses. So I'm like, okay, you want to play that way? Fine. You win a pawn. Are you proud? How much do you want that pawn? <laughs> so I just continue development, just move all my pieces over to the king side. You wanted a pawn? Here's another pawn. How many pawns do you want? Well, okay, it's not actually a pawn, because I do do rook takes. Otherwise, um, but still, I, here I'm saying, okay, you've got that f5 pawn that you've gone through so much effort to defend, and now that pawn prevents your knight from moving. And if you push the pawn, I just take it. And it's not so hard for you to defend everything, um, you know, material-wise. But the one thing that's a little bit tricky to defend is this guy in the corner. You know, gotta be a little bit concerned about his safety, you know? Um, I didn't expect him to take here. Um, I thought he would just defend his f-pawn and start really trying to liquidate and say, you know what, I messed up. I didn't really want that f-pawn so much. If it really bothers you, I'll just sack the f-pawn back, I'll get my pieces out, I'll have my king go to safety somehow, I'll develop my bishop and try to defend the f-pawn, and if I, you know, if I have to trade my bishop for your knight, I'll do that. 
even though I like having this persistent threat of just constantly taking on a6, I'll voluntarily allow you to trade like knight takes bishop or stuff like this, just so I don't lose my shirt. Or alternatively, um, you know, maybe queen e3, trying something more tactical to try to hold this. Even though it's pretty clear that if you really try to hold on to the pawn with all your might using just the queen, that's not such a pleasant experience either. Um, but yeah, as white, I would seriously be looking to liquidate as many pieces as possible here. Maybe consider a rook takes knight. Probably not. But at least look at it a little bit. But, nah. He takes here. And then he hits my rook. Okay. Well, I have a choice. Do I retreat? No. No, we're going to attack. We're tired of getting pushed around. We're going to push and see what he comes up with. All right. So he defends h2, to his credit. So I bring my fifth piece into the attack. I've got basically a flying V going on here. We've got everything piling on the h file, the g file. We've got threats of knight fh3, knight gh3, um, knight f3. It's, and then once I'm on f3, like everything is hanging. This is not a pleasant position for black or white. Um, so yeah, he takes on f4, and at this point, like, I know I said that I'm skimming over the tactical details of this game. Um, I've spent an enormous, inordinate amount of time calculating every position, trying to figure out at what point it's worth like sacking my queen side to go for this all-out attack, um, and to what extent I can continue development. Uh, without having to do any of these sacks. And in the game, he never ended up taking on b7 or a6 like that. Um, but at this point, I am down to like two minutes. I think three minutes here. And I just didn't see it. And in fairness, the right thing to spot is pretty challenging here. But, you know, this is a good puzzle. And it's kind of hurt a little bit by the fact that the solution's right there on the margin, and you probably have already looked at it. So, I guess without further ado, I'll just give away the solution. The solution here is knight h3. Now you might question, I mean, yeah, this is a pretty clear, obvious threat. Um, I thought my opponent could play knight g3. Um, but then here, knight takes. And this is considerably better initiative-wise than what happened in the game. Um, there's no way for my opponent to defend h2 other than going back like this. And if that's your only move, it's a pretty sad position. Because worst case, um, I've got this. But I think I have better. Uh, delete from here. We got something better after. Oh, wait, no. I'm sorry, I forgot. This actually defends the queen. That kind of changes things here. Um, hmm. What was I looking at, though? Was it like queen g5 or something? I don't remember. Knight f1 does put up some resistance. And it's this sort of nonsense that I couldn't figure out um, in extreme time trouble, because I just haven't played enough over-the-board games lately. Um, so I panicked and avoided all this, but let's see, what is the answer? Okay, so we were right after all with knight h3 and then bishop g2. Ah, rook hg4 hanging the queen key move. And if queen takes queen, we've got knight f2, rook g2 mate. That's how to finish a game. With three minutes on my clock, 
I didn't even see the beginning of this. Um, what I did see is that, hey, look, I'm winning in exchange. And my opponent doesn't really have any tactical shot at the moment. And so I'm like, okay, great. I'll go defend my stuff. And I just start shuffling around here, and I can't find a decisive blow. And I miss this. And now suddenly after this, the best I can do is just get a perpetual uh, through pawn takes. Well, I'm sorry. I interject this move. But yeah, the best I have at this point is just acknowledging that I've effed up. You get your perpetual check, and we're done. One mistake. Now, I mean, I didn't berate the point last game, nor did I berate it this game. The chess is hard. Um, but yeah, one mistake, and it's a draw. A draw against a player who's not played in many years, but also, well, and also has um, pretty high rating, but he's also underrated. So... Yeah, it was one hell of a game. Um, I couldn't bring myself to acknowledge this perpetual. Um, and it turns out that his rook to e8 is just ingenious. Um, again, here I don't really don't have anything better than going for a perpetual. Um, and I'm just in time trouble. I couldn't figure out what was going on here. Um, I think what I saw was that if I do queen here, I think I'm in really grave danger. I don't remember why. Stockfish, can you remind me? Um, I mean, there's queenie too, but I think there's something more pressing here. Maybe not. Maybe queenie too is the key. Um... But why not queen g or e8? Apparently, this gives away advantage. Okay, so apparently the key move is queen e2, rook f4, and then I walk into a fork. I didn't see that. I saw something else. At this point, it doesn't much matter because the move I picked was queen g5. I thought I was still doing okay here. That my opponent would somehow try to go for some perpetual if, like, Queen e7, or rook e7, or something like that. And I miss this. And in fairness to myself, my opponent cursed when he played this. Um, I didn't think that was the most sporting thing to do in this position. He, he had pretty much insinuated that, oh, I could just take this pawn, that he'd accidentally hung it. And I know that, like, if I'd actually fallen for this, then he would, after the game, be all over uh, saying either that he lucked out or that, uh, oh, hey, I said, damn, and you fell for it. And am I not so bright for saying this? And I just didn't want to chance it that, like, he was actually trying to trap me by doing that. I mean... Queen e4 doesn't really achieve much other than setting this trap. And I looked at this after a little bit of hesitation and thought I might still have some chances to draw this endgame. Uh, turns out that like this is losing in a thousand different ways, but it's not the most obvious thing ever. Uh, King g8 is a blunder because I could just play queen c8. And now he's winning the pawn. Okay. I did kind of sort of see this as in time pressure, but yeah, this is not so good. Um, and if I retreat, then he goes back. And at the very worst, we repeat the position, except he's on d7 instead of c7. He's working his way back over toward the king's side. Everything's defended. He doesn't have anything to worry about here. Um, and if I try something too aggressive, you know, this is not so pleasant either. 
So I saw all that. Uh, well, I'm sorry. I saw that after I fell for this. Um, but no, he does queen e6. He doesn't see that he could just collect the c-pawn and then go back to this position for free. He does play king g2. Um, and at this point I just panic. Um, and even here, my opponent was like, he's really stressed out. Um, he didn't know this endgame. I knew it. I knew this was just completely dead lost uh, with best play. But I also knew where the counter chances lay. So I just kept blitzing things out. Um, there wasn't anything better for me to do. This one might have taken me a little while to commit to. Um, I didn't expect him to play h4. I'd hoped that he'd try to do something on the queen side and f it up. Um, but, yeah, I couldn't scare him. And at this point, black just resigns because, um, well, let's count this out, shall we? One, one, two, two, three, three. Um, yeah, let's push four, five, check. That's what decides it. If not for that freaking check, I could promote, I would have something that might be challenging to him. Now that's the simplest possible line. He has other ways to win this too. Like, he doesn't, um, I don't think he has to go for all this complicated like, promotion race stuff. Um, even if he played c4, I still don't have any drawing chances here. Black is just much too slow. Now, if he plays, like, b3 on top of all of this, now we're kind of talking that I might be able to collect enough pawns, and if we trade off the h pawns, then maybe four pawns against a queen could maybe hold if my opponent f's up. But, um, yeah, I don't think so. I think he's just completely winning in all variations. Um, now, where he could mess up is if he goes, like, this way, then he's blown it. Um, but he's not going to do that. At this point, he does need to play h4, and he's just winning. Oh, wait. Okay, so I misevaluated this. Turns out black actually holds this? How? How in the world does black hold this? I mean, my opponent didn't go for any of this, but if he had... I mean, I see... I did see that I could take on a5, but... Oh, I don't have to push my king. Okay, so the idea is... Oops. Let's use the black for the black pieces. Um... Yeah, that's the idea. That's what combats this. So that's the 5-5 five to five race, and black promotes with check, and white does not promote with check. Kind of a crucial difference. Um, but yeah, because his pawn's on a light square, and g8 is a light square, there was nothing I could do to improve this any. So as soon as he plays g4... Uh, sit there, think about it a little bit, and just concede. Because he's pretty well focused. He's not moving any of these queenside pawns. He has the common sense to try to win this. Um, interestingly, some observers thought that this was drawn. Uh, just hadn't counted the pawns correctly. And by counted those correctly, I mean like back here. Um, some observer just didn't do the pawn count right. So, uh, but thankfully we got the result corrected. Um, so yeah, at the end of round two, I was sitting one and one. <sighs> so what did I do wrong this game? Obviously I missed rook... Well, the other sad thing about this... Oops. The other sad thing about this is that... In some sense, I did miss rook takes e5... In other senses, um, back here, where was it? Around here, 
I was considering, you know, why don't I just play queen f6 and really consolidate and try to hold this. That actually did cross my mind. That I just play queen f6, I try to find some way to collect the f-pawn, maybe I'm able to stir up activity somehow. I'm still concerned about my b-pawn being sketchy. Um, I just couldn't find a way to build any initiative after queen f6. Um, but it did cross my mind that, you know, I shouldn't be playing any of this. I should just try to slowly build something up, even though I don't see anything here. In particular, after knight e3, it's very difficult for black to make any progress. Um, computer likes it. Computer's okay with white, or black's position here. Um... In fact, it's saying just go back and start attacking again. Uh, but I felt not only was I having difficulty seeing anything here, but I felt a bit scummy about just playing a shuffling move in a position which demands that I play more actively. So, okay, in t extreme time pressure, I blew it. I did learn the opening idea that I have c5 and knight a5. Um, which I will remember from now on because I effed it up this game, giving him all these shots on the queen side. Um, I think where things started to go downhill, though, was here where I played knight h3. I've still been just so upset with my chess blindness after this one. <laughs> I think that impassioned things a bit. Uh, the sensible developing move I was considering before playing knight h3 was just knight f7. Saying, okay, I'm going to move another knight, move another thing. Um, thing. After the game, we were discussing the possibility that I just play f4 here and just say, you know, black wins. Um, it might take a thousand moves, but white really doesn't have any initiative. And so if black can just, like, bring all his pieces to the king's side, and not drop c7 with check. Black should win this after playing f4. Uh, but I got really excited about knight h3 and it just didn't peter out at all. But yeah, I've been so upset af about that that I just didn't closely look at this position afterward. Pawn takes pawn is sensible. Interesting. What about pawn f4? Does the engine hate this? Engine's okay with it. Uh, engine's slightly less okay with it. Um, I suspect that Engine wants to try to resolve things through tactical means, if possible. But yeah, I really like this pawn takes pawn idea. Vacating f4. Um, and white really wants to undouble his pawns, but having pawns in the center stands in the way of all of his pieces developing. So I like could take the pawn at the one occasion where he doesn't want to take it back. Um, noting that if knight takes pawn, I have knight takes pawn. No, I don't. No, I have knight takes knight. Uh, if queen takes queen, I've got knight takes pawn. And so, uh, in fact, we've got too many arrows here. Um, let's get rid of some of these arrows. They really don't serve to explain the variation very well. Yeah, this is something we found, and then, yeah, this is the point. So White just has to play defense. So this is like the one opportunity I had to play pawn takes pawn. Um, noting that if he does knight takes, he's losing a knight. Noting if he does pawn takes, this is not a pleasant position for white, because, I mean, look at this. Everything hits this damn square. Everything's impeded by the pawn. And I'm sure I've got tactical means to resolve this. Oh my god. Wow. Knight h3 is still possible. And here, this actually does just win instantly. Um, I guess he's got f4. But, man, would not want to be in white shoes here. How do I deal with this after? Oh, yeah, just take the rook. 
This is everything I saw in the game. Um, except I have to take on E4 first. So I missed that detail. And things fell apart. So, I don't know, I think that's just part of being rusty. I think with time, I would ha better handle these stressful positions. And I don't mean more game time on the clock, I mean just more experience in tournament positions. I think I'd better you know, figure out how to handle these practical positions. Yeah, spectators after the game were saying F4 here. I wasn't quite buying it. But pawn takes pawn is like super hard to calculate accurately. But now that I found this knight h3 idea, which I played in the game, I should have tried to figure out how to combine that with other ideas in the position. Instead of saying, you know, this just wins. Um, I was just mistaken. I should have seen rook d1. That would have made all the difference here. If I'd seen rook d1, I would have looked and seeing if I could find anything better than knight h3. Oh, during the game I also did see um, the blunder knight takes pawn, which in this position fails. Um, well, as it does after, um, I mean, even after pawn takes pawn takes, knight takes pawn still fails. I saw all that. Um, I didn't see that this removed both my f-pawn as well as my opponent's f-pawn. So this discovery, um, it actually works out. Um, I didn't see this. And that's kind of tricky to see, but I had enough time to figure it out. I just miscalculated. I think that's the, um, well, I was actually pretty tense this whole game, because I, I made so many mistakes on the queen side, and even on the king side, I wasn't sure of what I was doing. And hindsight makes the, hindsight and experience help out a bit, but the practical lesson here, ignoring the opening lesson, um, the practical lesson is just, when you think you found the winning move, um, yeah, okay, just be sure, be really sure, especially if it's a complicated position. I wasn't sure, I was like super tense, I actually got up away from the board after I played knight h3, because I couldn't handle it. Um, but no, I think I could do better. So, that was game two. Game three had kind of a similar flavor to it. Um, playing against a very young talent, very strong player, and he plays um, an old Benoni. I thought this was, I thought this could be called a check Benoni. If Black plays d6 and I play e4, I thought this was called a check Benoni, where the idea is White just stops b5 and stops f5, and White just wins. White eventually plays either b4 or f4 and crushes Black, and it hurts. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's good fun. Um, so, I've, I'm just so taken aback by this G6 thing. I'm like, wow, you have all the guts to play like this Czech Bononi thing, but then you're going to do a, fi a kingside fianchetto. That's a lot of pawn moves. That's a lot of holes. You haven't developed any of your pieces, and it's move four. And granted, white hasn't developed any pieces either, but white's got a large space advantage already. But we keep on this theme of like not activating pieces, so fine, whatever. Uh, I see that I'm eventually going to have to defend e4. I defend it this way, although this leads to all kinds of complications, but this also stops queen a5 check. Not that that was even a threat, but this stops it before it happens, now that the bishop's on c3, or g7. Uh, I do have to constantly worry about bishop takes knight, but I worried more than I needed to. Um, yeah, this is just 
positive for white. And so I'm trying to stop f5 before it happens. And there it is, f5. So here I am. My opponent I actually talked with the TD before the game. He's a friend of mine. Um, and while we have nothing shady or at all to discuss here, uh, we did notice that like we've all played in the same circuit, more or less, and we have plenty of published games. And did speak a little bit about the opening repertoire here. I mentioned how I'm going to go D4, basically. Doesn't matter what he does. I'm not going to play like other stuff that would happen after E4 here. Although I could. I've played E4 quite a bit, but I want to learn all this D4 stuff, so we're playing it. That's the plan this tournament. Um, so, stuck with the plan. Um, but, yeah, we mentioned how he tends to play this sort of strange um, Benoni thing. And uh, that's all that we had discussed about it. Like, we hadn't even talked about particular moves here. Um, other than I mentioned, you know, if he goes into a Grunfeld or a King's Indian defense, great. If he goes into a proper Benoni, great. Um, yeah, so I was kind of ready for this game. Hoping that we just get a nice, sensible opening position where we don't have both kings getting massacred, where there aren't pieces hanging everywhere, where I can just play some good, reasonable chess, right? I mean, I'm not going to be the one who concedes the playing their pawns to the third rank. Uh, I'm kind of hoping, hoping that my opponent will give me a space advantage. But if they don't, I'm not going to go out of my way to be provocative. Um, well, I guess I did go out of my way to be provocative because I'm like, okay, you want to play that. You're basically trying to play a king's indian defense with c5 i don't know those systems i know a king's indian defense i don't know this i'm not gonna just let you play this and execute your plan uh, i'm gonna stir up some trouble because also i don't believe in this g6 i mean yes if we do trade up pawns on f4 that bishop does get very active. But there's no way that this could possibly, in any universe, be justified as an opening. Um, you've put the pawn on e5 in the way of the bishop. And even once that pawn is out of the way, there's white has a space advantage. I mean, look, he's controlling b5, c6, e6, f5. Um... And that's ignoring what this pawn controls, and when the bishop takes, the bishop will be controlling stuff that the pawn used to control. And so you got some holes to worry about. Um, like here a hole, there a hole, everywhere a hole. Uh, I guess e 7 is not really a hole, because it's so far advanced into the territory that it's hard to do anything about. But black has developed one piece. Black's not going to be able to move any of his pieces anywhere. So, I just didn't believe this. I was super concerned that my opponent had some theoretical novelty. Something clever prepared. Um, I was also worried that he's going to try to put a piece on e5. Although, by the time he's played his knight to e7, he doesn't really have a way to put something on e5 without giving me a protected passed pawn on d5. So, like, if he plays knight d7, knight e5, I just take twice. I've got a protected passed pawn, and, you know, I eventually win the game. Somehow. Um, but I say that so casually, because taking twice will also leave holes over here. It's not like I just have the one trump. I have half open f file, and some holes to exploit over here, and maybe some stuff, some places to put the remaining pieces. Um... I don't know. Maybe it's more complicated than I think it is. 
Yeah, I don't know. Oh, I'm sorry. We did discuss this after the game. I was saying to the DD, well, what if he plays knight d7? Yeah. Tactics actually matter. I didn't see this. This is just so implausible to me that I thought he was just going to play knight d7, knight e5. Granted, I saw the idea that I could pile up on this d-pawn, but I didn't think it would be that easy. It ended up being super easy. Um, which is surprising, given my opponent's pretty high rating. But, okay, so we find ourselves here. Now I'm like, well, crap. I don't have my opening book prepared out this far. And what I was concerned about is, um, like, okay, if I castle, uh, he takes, and he's got this nice discovery, right? Um, that's the wrong color. Let's do this. That's kind of a problem. We can't let that happen. Um, but if I play queen d2, I mean, I consider queen c2, I might have briefly considered queen d2 here. Queen d2, I'm sorry, I consider queen c2 rejected it for the same tactical reason, but I think I did look at queen d2, and I'm, I saw that pawn takes pawn, knight takes, and he's got all this space behind my pawns. I have no way of shutting his bishop out. It's kind of like the opposite of that Grinfeld game. Um, but a couple points here. One, d6 is hanging. Like, that's pretty important. Two, if black does try to defend this, uh, d6, white can just castle. So, like, the fact that black's got these threats to try to stop white from castling isn't enough to prevent white from actually castling. And if black does try to play knight d4, um, we just liquidate, and then d6 is still loose. Okay. So he's got to go defend d6, right? And this is the only defensive try. But, I mean, look. White's basically developed all his pieces, and black is groveling. Um, bishop h6 is probably reasonable here. Bishop g5 is probably reasonable. Maybe even, in fact, you know, TD and I looked at this um, afterward, and I'm like, okay, sure, I win a pawn. The entire center is mine. Probably the game is mine because this e pawn is loose and there's holes on the king side and black hasn't developed anything. So I was worried about nothing here. Um, I just couldn't calculate this right. I'm hoping that over time I'll get more experience at understanding peace activity and where it matters and doesn't matter. And that bishop on the long diagonal spooked me. It really did. And the hole on d4 spooked me. And I just didn't give myself any credit for hitting this pawn on d6, because my opponent didn't give me any credit either. I'm sure had I just played queen d2, though, um, had I just played the sensible move, I think at this point my opponent would start giving me credit. Because d6 is really hard to hold. Um... And, I mean, what's black going to do? He can't do knight d6, or d7, because d6 hangs. He can't move his bishop anywhere. His pieces want to use the same d7 square. He's severely cramped. He's pushed his pawns on his king side. He has activated the rook. He has activated the bishop. What do you do? Pawn takes pawn can't be the answer. Oh my god. I was like, no, knight d7 can't be right. Okay, so yeah, Fritz gave pawn takes pawn as the best move. Um, you know when your candidate moves are pawn takes pawn and knight a6. That's something's not so good. And knight a6 isn't so pleasant either, because I just play a3 if I need to. If I need to. I might not even need to do that. Because, yeah, I just castle. And supposing he does play the knight forward, I just retreat. 
push a3, kick him back, and I'm just in a really pleasant position. So that would have been a nice way to proceed. Instead, I complicate everything, and I help my opponent get back into the game, and I further help him and get into the game, and I'm just missing tactical ideas left and right. I'm not going to belabor the points, because it's pretty clear that between the last game and this game, there's a lot I didn't calculate right. Um, I usually play king pawn openings. I'm trying to push myself into new territory, and it's hurting a lot, but uh, it's something to learn from. So, without much further ado, we just played a few more moves. So, I completely let him into the game. He played this, I take a knight, and I did end up winning the game. So, yeah, there is a, this is a game with tactical shots by both players. Um, I ended up getting the winning tactical shot here, which was unfortunate, um, because I think he did play excellently this game. Minus his atrocious opening decisions. Um, he made some pretty bad practical decisions, but... Yeah, tactically, he was spot on. Um, maybe I just need to focus on trying to play better positional chess, especially if I'm playing queen pawn openings. This isn't like my traditional king pawn nonsense where everything hangs all the time, and it's just a matter of getting the first tactic in. In queen pawn openings, I'm finding here that like getting the correct tactic um, is often pretty important. Um, yeah, we'll leave it after, um, this. Um, I just won the end game. You guys know how I play end games. Feel bad for my opponent, he's playing really well. But, um, that was that. Game four. All right. This starts to look familiar to my second round game, doesn't it? Which was not an omen I relished too much. I was hoping to get anything else, basically, because I blew the second round game. Uh, you all saw it. Um, got a winning position and then just threw it out. And so I was hoping that wouldn't happen again this round. Um, I was also hoping that my opponent would play just slightly more passively. But this is actually my wheelhouse, this completely unsound opening, allegedly. It's actually probably unsound. But it's my wheelhouse, I play it. Um, this would be actually a moment, if we've got the opening explorer. Uh, can I get that on screen? Didn't mean to zoom out like that. Let's zoom back in. No games found after queen e4. Oh, that's right. Yeah, we were looking in the database afterward. and couldn't find this either. Um, but, yeah, I play king d6, play king c7, and my opponent has three pawns for the piece. And now we just play chess. I was relieved. After three games, I finally get to play a sensible chess game where one player isn't trying to knock the other player off the board instantaneously. I mean, we had knight g5, we had the fried liver attack, but things have calmed down a bit. Um, and so I'm trying to get into an endgame. Uh, although, here I wasn't too pleased to have played queen g6. I was mostly using this as a means to try to get um, pressure on the queen side uh, without exposing my king to horrifying attacks that were sure to follow. Here, I strongly considered pawn takes knight. Um, just couldn't find any way to build an initiative after pawn takes knight. I'm pretty sure it's bad. But this would be a way for black to proceed here. Um, that tries to uh, either equalize or better. Hey, LC. Yep, they're just looking at games from the first half of a round robin. The second half is coming up, uh, 
in a pretty uh, weekend that's coming up soon. Uh, I see all the crowd is here. Very good. Um, I guess I'll go back to the top then. So we had a fried liver attack. Um, this was very. This is round four. Very similar to my round two game. Um, although there, my opponent didn't go for knight g5. Um, my rationale behind um, rationale behind this allowing this fried liver attack is that I've been playing this since the dawn of time. Um, I'm reasonably confident playing it. Um, I don't know the Traxler, unfortunately, but also I have no faith in it. I actually believed in this fried liver stuff. Having gone uh, uh, over the game afterward and looked at a modern database, I'm starting to question my life decisions playing this. Um, no, I'm kidding, but yeah, I don't think I'm going to be playing the fried liver too much um, in future tournaments. I might break it out in the second half of this tournament. We'll see. Um, it's a really ballsy opening. And it gets super complicated positions. And if white's not careful, black just, like, wins. Um, but yeah, as it played out here, I just got a position where, okay, white's given up a knight. Black's given up three pawns, so it's even. Um... So, here we got bishop g5. I thought it was all clever during the game, like, oh, surely you wouldn't put your queen on h6, because this would just help me build up an initiative against your king, and it's just super uncomfortable, and nobody would grovel like that. My opponent grovels. And I'm like, damn, how am I supposed to try to get any kind of imbalanced position here? Like... Most opponents would not realize just how terrible this endgame is for white if you exchange queens. Um, and it's only so terrible because black is collecting that c2 pawn. And with that c2 pawn, black now has um, a knight for two pawns. And white can't promote a pawn on the king's side. It's just too slow. Feingl did a lecture on this. Huh. I find that, well, okay, I guess I can't be the only person who came up with this king c7, bishop d6, bishop d7 idea. I have seen one or two other people mention this before. Um, so, yeah, whatever. I'm not going to slander him, but if you have something positive to say, by all means. I know that's constructive for you to say, and I, it might even be true, I don't know. I'm not going to go after him, though. So I'm going to focus on the game here. So, yeah, I figured that, like, if I could just get that C2 pawn, um, and then escape my knight to safety, that I'm just having a much superior endgame. That's all I was hoping for. Um, so, unfortunately, my opponent sensibly liquidates in the center. I thought they would want to hold on to that knight, because the knight is a useful piece to attack a king in coordination with the other pieces. Um, but no, my opponent's saying, you know, I'll just keep a bishop pair. Um, downside for white of giving up that knight, or trading knights is that now white's unique pieces are not as unique. White has no knights. Um, so, um, I haven't mentioned the player's gender till now, although you can see it in the margin. Um, yeah, so she was doing a lot of really sensible moves here. Um, but she's not very greedy. Like, the greedy thing would be to say, I'm going to keep the knights on the board until my opponent trades the knights, giving up some space, or until I find a way to exchange my knight for a bishop, and then maybe I can press with some sort of advantage. Um, however, yeah, 
this being the case, this being what happened in the game, um, yeah, she just like gets the position where, okay, white, white can't get any kind of lasting endgame. Well, I'm sorry, white. Yeah, if this goes to an endgame, it's going to be very difficult for white to win it. But also, without that knight on the board, it's very difficult to break through black's defenses. Because now all you have are bishops and pawns and rooks and a queen. You don't have a knight to break things up if things somehow stagnate. Um, so, so what we're looking at next is white just playing some sensible moves. And this just gets really complicated. I take an open file. I play a developing move. Um, I see that white's building some initiative and I do manage to escape with my shirt. So, yeah, rook f8 fortunately does not hang everything. Otherwise, h7 might be dropping with tempo, but now that I've got rook f8 in, I can play rook f7. I can hold my h pawn, I can hold my seventh rank. I'm not giving up the center and maybe eventually over time I can exploit some holes on the king side. Um, so this protects the rook which was otherwise hanging because this bishop was pinning. So the bishop here no longer defends f8. So I had to move the rook but also moving the rook activated it. I saw that back here somewhere. Um, I think somewhere around here I was seeing that, yeah, white does kind of threaten bishop f6. Um, yeah, after rook e1, I saw this bishop d5 idea. Trying to coerce black into playing pawn takes bishop, but pawn takes bishop's not necessary. And black can complete development without hanging material. So black is equalized. And now we just have a really challenging game ahead. Um, one in which I actually have to push this pawn to activate my bishop. And so, again, white has three pawns, black has a bishop instead of a knight. Um, so, being somewhat sensible, I protect my c-pawn, because I'm not sure where my queen goes, I'm not sure where my bishop goes. Okay, so, with rook d1 now played, I now realize my opponent's not going to be pushing f5 anytime soon, because f5 would hang e5. Yeah... Believe me, this was very difficult for me. Um, I spent a lot of time this game. Even having played these moves like c5 and b6, which I'm just throwing out there now, it wasn't so clear to me during the game that I could get away with this. I was concerned about white pushing in the center, or white somehow liquidating and maybe building up some initiative and getting multiple... I mean, white has two protected past pawns. It just happens that because this pawn is so f keeping the g-pawn at bay, we're not going to see like g4, f5, e6 anytime soon. Because I control this square. Um, this control here is like, if I didn't have that, um, this would be a very different game. With potentially three protected past pawns running down that side of the board. Um... Yeah, no, you're right. I'm just saying it's not easy. Yeah, you're right, black is just winning this. Um, but it, this is far from easy, I'll say. Yeah. Well, right, and because we have a three-on-three -three situation on the queen side, I can't get a passed pawn here. And even if I could, it would jeopardize my king. But figuring out how to activate my pieces while maintaining kingside threats is not so easy. Especially with white constantly threatening to play this rook d1, rook d6 stuff. Or queen d2, queen d8 check. Or b4, or any of these things. Like, And if we trade off the wrong pieces, I get a lost endgame. It's by keeping the right pieces on the board that I'm able to win this. Um, but yeah, 
I agree, black is much, much better here. Probably winning. Um, but I don't think that this is easy for black to convert. Um, white has lots of activity. And we'll see what happens in the game. It's pretty exciting. So finally, here we are on move 29. And I just see that I don't have an open file for my rook. I really need an open file. And okay, white's threatening e6 in some sense, but just tactically it's not there. Um, yeah, you, I'm not sure about that, Mick. You're not going to convince anybody with that kind of argument. You need a stronger argument. Um, you're right that like top 10 GMs will memorize stuff. And maybe even top 100 GMs or top 1,000 chess players, including some IMs. Well, no. Top 1,000 are all GMs, too. Maybe there are even some IMs that memorize some lines out this far. This is too far. If anybody were memorizing stuff, that memorization would have ended... Um, well, obviously my opponent wouldn't have played G3, but... The memorization would probably end like five to ten moves from here, or I move sixteen. I think you're overstating it, saying thirty moves. And black has plenty of alternatives here too. So, yeah, I mean you could foresee this queen g8. Queen g6 is probably harder to memorize. And even if you were relying on memory, you still have to deal with both pawn takes and knight takes here, which you could do. But somewhere around here, like queen f5, who's going to memorize that? Yeah, and memorization's not the best way to go either. But I'm just saying I don't even think some of this could be memorized. But the key idea here... White has deprived black of all other possibilities. Black can't push on the queen side. Black can't take the center. Black doesn't have an open file. Black can't go like queen h3 and try to checkmate. It just tactically doesn't work. So black just has to play a positional move. h5. Okay. White is trying to push e6 with tempo. Black says no. Admittedly, I did not anticipate rook d5. But it's not good either. It's scary, but white's not defending c4. I think white probably, I don't know, needs to play b3 at some point. Or b4, or something. If you're going to play rook d5, you need to play b3. And then your queen's free to move anywhere. Um... Or you need to start pushing the queen side pawns, which I was not afraid of. Because um, black's pieces just move around uh, white's too efficiently. So, yeah, this rook d5 forced me to play queen e6 to stop the e pawn. I was concerned that now I don't have any mating net threats, but um, there's one little detail here. So, I've been told that um, the pawns are all named the Aries, right? You heard of this theory? I think Simon Williams came up with it. I've seen a recent addendum to this theory. So, the pawns named like Airy and Barry and Carry, like the A pawn, B pawn, C pawn, and such. I've seen a new theory. So, we have like Airy the A pawn, Barry the B pawn, C Carry the D pawn, and then we've got Derry, Eerie, Fairy, Gary. And Clyde. And here we go with Clyde. It all makes too much sense. Um, yeah. Clyde's going to carry the day. Um, I'm not even so concerned about losing Clyde there. Um, it's just like I need this as a means to open up a file for my rook. And if this is the only way that I can develop my rook anywhere then this is what we got to do. Um, I mean, even if this rook weren't on f7, I'd probably still end up playing h4. Ah, I see somebody's not played Pac-Man. 
all right there's a joke there somewhere um but yeah actually i know i'd have to play rook f7 first because otherwise oh uh, i scrolled by accident um but if not for this um g4 would make things pretty complicated but in this position because i got pressure well in fact let's not do this with arrows let's do it this way um you know the way where i get the mouse slip in so you guys get to laugh at it now there we go um so yeah if not for this little shot here um then i wouldn't be able to push h4 and without h4 then queen e6 wouldn't make any sense without queen e6 then this h5 in the first place would be pretty bad even though it's black's chance at winning um black does need to be concerned about white trying to win this too uh during the game i thought that rook h6 looked reasonable and i'm sure it, there's some tactical refutation of this somehow um so I wasn't so sure about this during the game. Uh, I've seen queen f1. Then what? Rook d7. Heaven. Oh. Is black just much too fast here? Uh, yeah, okay. Rook d7 makes sense. Um, I'm still not sure that I believe in rook d5. Um, not sure that I believe in Queenie too, but the engine believes it. Why does the engine recommend this? Like, what's going on here? How is this any different than just pushing the pawn? What's so different? I analyzed this during the game, but with the pawn back on h5. I don't get it. I mean, if this is the best... Oh, this just doesn't... Okay, that's the point. Is that white gets a tempo. As opposed to what I was looking at during the game, which was pawn push, king takes, pawn takes, queen takes. Here, yeah, I saw that, like... Um, wait. Yeah, I saw this was no good for white. Um... I did calculate queen e5, king d7, and what did I look at next here? I mean, yeah, I did see b3. Um, I'm not so sure I believe in queen e2. I saw this, and I'm like, you know, if I get this position, I'm not going to lose this. Objectively speaking, I should win this, but it's not so easy. Um, if I get a position which I can't possibly lose which deals with most of my concerns out of the opening i'm not sure that i would have found this there's a little subtle point here that at the end of everything there's queen e1 and um yeah we got um some serious threats going on here um yeah but my resolution here was that e6 just hangs a pawn and doesn't get anything. So that's why I played h5 and did not fear e6 here. So got Clyde the h-pawn, saving the day. Um, giving me that open file that I need. But look! Uh, wrong color, sir. Hey, look at that. White's still making my life difficult. Of course I'm not going to take on d5, even though that wins an exchange. Even though it's probably okay. We're not going there. We're going here. We're saying, okay, enough of this. Um, you know, it's wonderful and all that we've gone 33 moves into a game without me making a threat. Um, but now I'm actually making a threat. Or threatening to threaten a threat. Um... So, my threat to threaten a threat is that if this rook moves, I've got the obvious. Yeah, you see it. We all see it. So, this rook is stuck. Um, but also, I mean, look at this. This is just hideous. I mean, this, even if this um, rook doesn't move, 
I've just got Rook H7. You know, no checks, no captures. Just, you know, threatening mate. That's all. So, nice, good positional mate threat. Um, I guess the term for that is a mating net. Um, so, yeah, just develop, you know, put the rook on the open file. Say, okay, it's great, we've had some fun playing this fried liver. It's my turn to attack. Um, yes, yeah, so this, this is more than a bit concerning, I will say. It did take some guts on both players' part uh, to commit to this variation. Um, but, you know, once we're here, um, it becomes a little bit easier to play. So I see that if white just ignores every... Well, the other key point I saw here, which saves my sanity, is that if queen f7, I just take it. And there's no pro, um, promotion occurring for multiple reasons. One of which would just be queen to h8, but the other is just taking. So, um, so I don't need to worry about a perpetual check, because there's no check here. Um, and if white just pushes the pawn, I go and mate. Um, so, yeah, here um, white plays the best move. I check, I check, and that's the game. Now you might ask, why is that the game? Well, let's say um, white's not content just doing that. Um, oh, wow, that's illegal. So let's say white plays here. What's the move, guys? What's the move? Does anybody see the move? There's probably more than one answer. During the game, I only needed one answer. Although I did consider multiple things, like five moves back, as to what could happen here. So we got one vote for Rook D2. Going once, going twice. Yeah, Rook D2 probably wins. Let's take a look. Um, so, um, yeah, yeah. LC sees the stuff that I'm up to, but I'm curious where this goes, and I'm too lazy to calculate it. So we're gonna ask Stockfish what how this goes. So, yeah, and then you got c4, and then you've got, like, queen d1, and queen d2 mate. Simple. I mean, it works. It's pretty awesome. Uh, yeah. The thing that convinced me all the way back, um, back here to go to for queen h3 was um, this here tactic. Not that. This. Uh, let's promote that variation. So I saw that um, back when I played queen h3. Because if you don't see that, white's just promoting, and it's scary. Um, but White doesn't promote fast enough, and bishop takes d5 doesn't ruin anything. Uh, in fact, it makes the skewer more effective. Uh, although, I guess it actually doesn't. Because uh, with a rook on d5 and a king on d3, the king would actually be blocking the interference move of rook d3. So, okay, bishop takes rook was unnecessary, but... Um, did help my opponent figure out how um, to concede gracefully. But no, I think my opponent resigned at exactly the right moment. 
I myself probably would have played on this much, if not further. Um, oh, Queen E2 is stronger. Let's see. Yeah, Queen E2 is mate in four. Uh, Queen King C3. I saw this much during the game. Um, but I didn't see how to finish this. And how to finish this is a very nice motif. Chasing the king around in a little circle and using the rook as a backstop to, um, yeah, that's beautiful. But yeah, had the game come to it, I would have just won the queen and said, you know what, it's round four of a game, of a tournament. I don't need to find fancy stuff at this time, I just need to win. Um, and the other point, of course, is the maiden one. So... Well played by um, both players. A lot of sharp things going on. Um, granted, uh, the opening is kind of in disrepute. Um, I might have to retire that one and like pick up the Traxler or uh, the Fritz or the Uvelstad or something else. Um, yeah, but here I am. Um, what was my result this far? I think I was three out of four as of this game, uh, so that was cool. Very exciting game. A lot of exercises for the student to figure out afterward. I probably will need to revisit this game at another point if I'm going to just keep pursuing the fried liver. I need to better understand all these positions. But I think I'd be better served learning the Fritz. Um, Fritz, there is actually a variation that I think was introduced in the 90s called the Fritz Variations. Yeah, well, so the thing about this half, I mean, you, you probably missed game three, which ended on a less than dramatic note here where my opponent just accidentally hung a piece and I just won after that. Um... Game two, I blew after getting a winning position. I was pretty ticked about it. But, you know, um, my opponent was playing and has a pretty strong result in this event. Uh, I was playing very well. Um, hmm. I'm going to hold back my criticism of other things that other people said during the event because I don't need to repeat them here. Um, Music Dan gets upset when he plays a game that goes for five hours and he loses it. Music Dan doesn't handle that very well. <laughs> no, Music Dan goes out and gets some food after that. Uh, um, well, no, I think the one, no, so the constructive thing I do after that is like, okay, I had a really strong position. I didn't play a perfect game by any stretch of the imagination. The best revenge I could possibly get from that is figuring out, okay, how are all the various ways I effed up? And can I figure out any of this that I just learned from? Um, so I'm not going to F up like that again. But yeah, food helps. Um, water helps. Walking it off a little bit helps. But also, studying through the game afterward, asking the opponent, asking spectators and friends and such for feedback on the game, um, trying to figure out what the heck happened, what was wrong in my head that I could have possibly lost it. <laughs> um, and then just seeing, you know, is this something that I think I can do better with? Or do I think I've hit my limit? Um, and then it's time to pack up the chessboard and start playing Go or something. Because, um, you know, eventually somebody, everybody plateaus at some point and then they come back to the game later and either do better or worse. But it's an adventure. It's supposed to be fun. What I found making the game fun lately is um, not playing King Pawn openings. King Pawn openings are not so fun for me anymore. I'm just tired of all the memorization that goes with them. And, you know, I'm learning to play Queen Pawn openings, so it can be good fun. 
Um, yeah. Everybody seems to be really excited about my rating. Um, no, I'm like 1950 USCF and 2000 FIDE. So, yeah, I'm a pretty strong amateur player. Um, I'm playing in a nine-round invitational locally. And so, um, yeah, after the first four rounds of this event, we see I'm three out of four. Um, so this invitational was supposed to be, like, as many experts and strong players as we could get locally. Um, turned out that some people couldn't quite make it after having committed to have joined it. So we had some last-minute replacements. Um, that last, um, five rounds here, some of my opponents were said replacements, although they played quite well. I respect that. I was not too pleased to find out that I was playing replacements, like younger kids who have lower ratings but play really well. Or players who have rusted a bit, and, or whatever, but everybody's playing a really good tournament. I just don't like playing somebody who's going to play the Gioco Pianissimo and play the same thing that they've done a thousand times and, like, never take any risks. Um, it's kind of the opposite of my style. Um, but, yeah, so... Um, I don't know, my plan, I guess in the immediate future, is to learn Queen Pawn openings and see how far I get with that. Um... I don't have any aspirations to play big tournaments or anything, although I could, but, um, you know, if I learn just to play better, maybe I'll find um, competitive and tournament chess less of a chore and something more to be uh, cherished. It just becomes a chore. Um, well, it's a function of two things. One playing opponents who just clearly don't know what they're doing. And two, playing opponents who just wipe the floor with you and you didn't know what you're doing. In both of those situations, it's not very satisfying. Um, and let's see, how do these five games... Well, let's see, game one, I just completely outclassed my opponent. Game two, uh, I think my opponent outclassed me, although I did outcalculate him. He still beat me anyway, because he understood what was going on. It, ultimately, I did blunder and he did outcalculate me, but um, so I think he outfinessed me that game. Um, game three, we both didn't know what we were doing, um, so that was an exciting game. Uh, although it got extremely sharp and, um, I didn't, I underperformed that game compared to how I usually play. I was just fatigued or something, but yeah, I was just having an extreme uh, case of chest blindness. And I think part of that might have had to do with my, uh, food choices, um, during lunch between the rounds. Just, I it's not feeling my greatest, um during that third game. But also my opponent played well. He's played a structure he's played many times that I've never seen before, other than in books. Never played before, other than maybe one or two Blitz games ever. Um, and he's played the system that he's played maybe a hundred or a thousand times. Uh, granted, I almost wiped him uh, off the map right in the opening, so it even though it's not the most sound system ever, it got him what he needed to get. If I'm facing him again, I'm going to play the refutation of his system, and I'm just going to win. Um, but I don't think that's going to happen again. I think he's going to learn something from it too. Even though he's probably pissed that he dropped a piece, and um, I don't know if he's capable of analyzing the entire game and looking for the good that both players did, time will tell. Um, yeah, this is just a local tournament. 
Uh, and then we have this game four here where, <laughs> oh dear, um, I want to say I knew better what was going on because uh, I played the fried liver. This is like the opposite of round three where I played an unsound system um, and afterward took a lot of criticism from spectators and the TD, who is a good friend. But he's right to point out that the fried liver is not something I should be playing at this level. Um, alright, we got a link here, what's the link? I'm guessing he's probably linking to... Yeah, you can go find the tournament on the USCF pages, uh, given enough effort. Um, you also know my name, and you could go look that up, and once the tournament's posted, you'll see all the details there too. I just don't make a habit of talking too much about, um, local stuff on the stream. Yeah. But yeah, I hope that he's capable of looking at the whole game and figuring out that I almost busted his opening and that if we ever play that again, I am going to refute his opening. Um, I mean, you know my Lee Chess profile. Whatever. You know I'm a contributor for Lee Chess. It's really easy to look up information about me. Anyway... Um, yeah, no, I played a bad system this round, and, um, but I happen to know it better. But, yeah, it took a lot of criticism, uh, from many players, um, and I'm looking forward to studying other stuff. Like, maybe I'll go back to playing the Italian, but probably not. Instead, I probably do want to stick with the two knights, but that entails that I study other things. Um, so, after this, uh, we're going to look at round five here, where I got my second black in a row. Uh, can Lee just please load this? Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for the advice. If I ever need to become, like, a world champion, I'll bear that advice in mind. Um, no, studying tactics, yeah. No, you're right. That can get you there. It's just not a very enjoyable path. I'm going to stick with my queen pawn. I'm just... There's too much to memorize. Um, okay. So here we are, a scotch game. My second black in a row. Second black the same day. So it's kind of a tiring affair. I just completely blanked on my opening prep. Um, like, here, I've played once. I've played 10,000 times. I've played bishop c5 here. And the idea is knight here. You threaten the mate. And it's just a decent position. Although white is not supposed to go for that. White's supposed to play this instead. Um, and then you have a choice of multiple pleasant options. Just develop your pieces, you know, play chess, have fun. Um, not sure why I didn't go for this. And white just develops, you don't hang the bishop like I've hung several times before. White castles, black castles, and you play chess. And it's pretty equal. I just completely blanked that, like, bishop c5 is the thing that I always play here. Um, so, I played knight f6, and then I realized, oh crap, yes, book here is pawn takes, but I'm playing a lower rated player, like somebody much, uh, I'll say that, I don't know, they're a good player, but yeah, this is book, you're supposed to go into an endgame and it's just drawn. That's how this is supposed to go. Um, yeah. So, I wasn't going to settle for that. Um, the draw in question is you just trade queens. Okay, black has lost his castling rights, but there's really nothing going on in this position. Uh, I mean, 
mean, yeah, B takes C6 is the more popular move. Alright, am I just mistaken? Let's find out. So, opening explorer, tell me. Uh, yeah, B, C6 is the main line. D6, 6 has been played. I must be confusing this with the Pierce. The Pierce is, again, this goes back to memorization. Um, there's the line in the Pierce where I'm confusing that with something else entirely, too. What am I confusing here? There's some line where there's an exchange on d8, and it's just supposed to be okay. Um, that's not this opening, though. Whatever. So I played b takes, and it's okay. My opponent played queen e2, which I think maintains a slight edge. Um... It's very uncomfortable for black. I mean, this entire game just makes me cringe, but um, I did not play this very well. Uh, I wonder, had I prepared better, what would I have prepared here? D6. Okay, so the move I did play, D6, fine. Is this the master database? Yes, this is. Okay, so then we got G3. Bishop e7, still master move. Bishop b7, not a popular move. Throughout this, I was considering d5. Um, I was even considering bishop e7 here. Bishop e7's been played before, but white scores much better. White scores much better after d6. I considered queen e7, and I was like, well... Um, I was worried about e5. But, um, apparently black's just fine here. Even after white gets this nice... Oh, that's cool. Bishop a6. You don't have to play it, though. It's too fancy. It really is. And, yeah, black's fine here. e5 is overextended. There aren't enough pieces to support it. So it's going to liquidate. A draw will occur. Um... But also, it's difficult to get a useful pawn imbalance here for, like, trying to win against a lower-rated player. Um, um, I don't know. Queen is fine. Um, it's not easy for black to exploit, because white has no weakness. White has only pushed the e-pawn. Black's got doubled pawns. This is just not very pleasant for black. And granted, it's okay. Black can get a draw. But I'm playing somebody who I outrate by like 400 points. So I'm not looking for a draw. Yeah. And it makes sense that bishop c5 is popular. Um, but yeah, in light of all of this, I should have just played what I play like all the freaking time. And just play bishop c5. So this is usually how I play this here. It affords a exciting game. Um, if I had tons of time, I would study Queen H4. I've looked at this several times. I could just never remember it all. And it's not actually winning or anything. I mean, black shouldn't be trying to win, but it's imbalanced. It gives both players something to fight for, and it's just dangerous. Um, Kasparov played this maybe a couple times back in the 90s. And got somewhat popular at that time. Um, is there some other way I can play this, though? Like if he plays d4, I have to take it. I could just do knight takes, and then just play a complete chess game without the knights on the board, but he still has a space edge. Um, and it's not even like that's an isolated pawn, so trading pieces doesn't help against it. Um, I'm trying to remember if g6 is a thing I've seen here. I'm confusing that with the Rui line, where I think the Cozio defense, knight ge7 and g6 and bishop g7, which is playable, but, um, okay, there go my arrows. 
Yeah, the only way to avoid this, and that's if you really need to avoid this, is just don't play e5. Um, yeah. And queen f6 is a move, but it doesn't do better than um, bishop c5, so bishop c5 is the thing I play here. Um, I think this does afford both players a lot of things to play for. But I was not, well... Yeah, maybe I didn't blank on my prep. I just didn't want to go into this against somebody who surely had prepared for this. Um, yeah, right. Yeah. Living without space is not something that I do here. I fight for space. Um, but, yeah. I don't know, there's a lot of really interesting things you can do if you play less aggressively. Um, well, no, there is one other way I can avoid this. And one only. There it is. That's what I can do to avoid all of that. To avoid the fried liver, to avoid uh, a scotch opening, to avoid the Evans Gambit. Like, all of that gets avoided with this. But then you have to be playing the Scandinavian. Um... I mean, no, there's other ways, but this doesn't give up much space. It's just this has been analyzed to death. Um, it's not the most fun thing to play. Um, I'm not picking up, like, the Sicilian right now. Yeah. Well, no. I think this... I don't think this is inferior to any other opening. Uh, I just was shocked by knight takes c6, although it is a main move there, as is b takes. I just didn't expect uh, a lower rated player to go into this kind of positional approach. That really surprised me. Because um, I don't have any way to exploit this, although it makes sense. Like, if I were rated lower than my opponent, I'd play something that's not the most exciting thing in the book. Um, Queen E2 is wrong. Pray tell, is there a refutation for Queen E2? I think it's okay. I think white has a small plus here. Yeah, this is an interesting suggestion. Uh, I guess one detail to note is this. You don't want to forget about... Well, no, that doesn't actually work here. I saw this during the game. Um, so you don't quite get away with that. Um, so, yeah. It's not so clear what goes on. I mean, well, this is what we were looking at a second ago, wasn't it? Although now I've got a bishop out here, which is easily kicked. So I don't like that. Yeah, bishop e7 looks fine. Um, um, although, I kind of like what I was seeing in the opening explorer here with just queen e7. And, you know, if we go into here, fine. I could probably undermine this. Well, I don't know that I like this so much anyhow. Yeah, maybe I don't. Maybe bishop e7's okay. Um, it's certainly far outside of what I studied. Um, yeah. That does look fun. <laughs> for white. Um, so. Yeah, 6d6. This is what I did play. And I think this is fine. It's not, I don't like it, but, um, well, actually, wait, why don't I just play d6 here? I mean, this looks fine. Eventually, I'm threatening to push g6 and f5 if I'm crazy. This does deny my bishop the ability to move, but that happens in the game anyway. If I'm going to play d6, why not just play it here? 
and then I don't have to worry about e5 ruining my day. Right, this is an exchange fill door. Um, well, actually, not this. Um, you don't even have to throw that in. You just there it is. Um, but this way, I don't get mated. Uh, or I don't drop a piece, or something horrifying doesn't happen in the center. No, you're right that it is meh, but, I mean, it's something. And I guess what we got in the game, too, was something, but this was just a really not comfortable position. Like, <sighs> e5, what do you do? Do you have to take it? This is not so easy. You have to take it. That's what I was thinking. And, I mean, you've got doubled C pawns. Both players have a bishop pair. Um, this has been played once in the database. So out of a sample size of one, black wins all the time. Um, okay, I see opinions differ on this. Um, Oh, well, that's nice. If you can undouble the pawns. Yeah, goodness. That's pretty nice. Black does have better development. Um, I just... Like, if I'm trying to play to win, I don't want to liquidate stuff that quickly and give myself a weakness. But Black does have a development edge, so... I guess E5 is nothing to fear? Okay. Weird. Um, it makes sense, though. I mean, you get good development in. You gain maybe like two tempi in the opening, but... Um, that's... <laughs> yeah. It makes sense. If I'm gonna stand up and fight for something... That'd be the sort of thing I should fight for. Although if I'm going to play classically, this is the classical way to do it. Just don't get into this stuff. Deal with all these complications, which are a lot easier. Um, White's not going to take on c6, though, if he knows the theory. He's instead going to allow the c3, knight g7, bishop c4. Um, yeah, and this is just equal. There's a lot of pieces still on the board. There's still a pawn imbalance. Black has not doubled his pawns. This is good fun. Uh, here, with doubled pawns, black does get more activity, but I don't see a weakness on white side of the board. But yeah, there's an immense amount of things to play for. Either player can play for a win there. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, Queen E2 is fairly normal. Not just in the Scotch, but the French. Um, at least one French. Um, I mean, normally developing your Queen in the opening like this is a bit silly. But here I think it's well justified by Black's difficulty just black doesn't have control of d4 or e5 anymore um and so if white can force some more i mean yeah black's gonna get a nice initiative going but i don't think it leads anywhere um Yeah. I mean, it violates everything we know about opening theory and developing pieces and not blocking yourself and castling and all that good stuff. But it does these things for a reason, and that reason's hard to deal with. Um, 
I mean, yeah. <sighs> I don't know. I just don't see any weaknesses on white side of the board. It seems like a very challenging position for black to play for a win. Um... So, here, anyway, my opponent does play g3, so I'm, like, way out of my comfort zone here already, because e5 is imminent, and bishop g2 threatening the c6 pawn is also imminent. Um, yeah. Oh, I agree. It, in hindsight, it very much looks like they just didn't know any of this. But the problem is I don't know enough opening theory to refute everything that they do that's outside the book. But yeah, they're afraid. Um, yeah, so anyway, we developed some pieces. I guess I shouldn't stick on the opening too long because there's just... I don't know that there's much to say about this game in general, other than we're both very confused about what's going on. Um, here I had the opportunity to immediately play e5, or I was considered, well I can't play c5 here, I wanted to. Um, yeah, it's just a very difficult position, because I've not played the opening accurately, I've made it very difficult. Uh, I've got doubled pawns on the C file, and it's just, yeah. I mean, I've certainly punished a number of games where White's played E4 and Bishop G2, but those were games where I was able to get a pawn on E5 really easily without any negative consequences. Here, we just wander all over the position trying to find tactics, trying to find something. Um, and here my opponent breaks out f4. And I'm not looking forward to getting um, an isolated king pawn and doubled c pawns, and all of them being pawn islands, so I have to take. But I saw this. Um, I miscalculated something somewhere in here. I thought I was able to finally get out of all this pressure with tempo. Um, so what was this with rook f7? I forget. Oh, the point is that, like, okay, yeah, he could push e5. Here, in hindsight, and I saw this during the game and I forgot about it, I could have played bishop d4, check. And, okay, he could move the king over. And um, now c7 is hanging. But it becomes important that there's no e5 discovery threatening to win a bishop. As there might be in the game. Yeah. But also I've got bishop e5. Um, and then if... I mean, I could even just play bishop e5 directly. And if he wants to try to... Well, no, this hangs the c-pawn. C5, and then, well, I might be trapping a bishop. Um, that's a bishop trap. So white's going to sack, and he's going to get multiple pawns for the bishop, but that's a trapped bishop. Um... So, yeah, right, and since I'm playing somebody who's far lower rated, I am trying to play for a win. Um, yeah, so I do end up playing this bishop check although not at the relevant moment, although it doesn't matter, just given how things petered out. This was my one chance during the game, 
Um, so just go for broke. Um, and the way to do that would be king g7. So I'm defending this, I'm defending c6. I finally activated my bishop. And if he plays bishop e6, I can just move my rook. This would be the way after 25 long and exhausting moves. With one accurate move, I could finally start to realize some sort of initiative here without having given up any kind of positional concession other than these double pawns I had to give up earlier. Um, so that's exciting, I guess. Um, actually, in hindsight, I should actually prepare a second opening just for players that I outrate. Um, and for quite a while, the opening I was studying, it's not the Scandinavian, not the Sicilian. Uh, no, it was uh, the Aliokin, or Aliokin. I think that would be something that could strike terror in the hearts of opponents without um, causing me too much grief. I think that's something I could prep. But that's all just so I could try to max out my rating by winning against everybody high rated, low rated, mill rated, picking an appropriate repertoire for various opponents. Oh yeah, no, white can go for drawish lines and anything if he wants to. He just has to prepare them all. He's got to be prepared for anything black can play. And I think it's easier to prepare for most things. I mean, I could just play the modern. I could play the French. Um, but, yeah, the other can is something club members tend to play against me. So I should have some working knowledge and experience there. I should be able to leverage that um, to punish opponents who aren't prepared. Uh, either that or, I don't know, play something less ambitious. Maybe a Philidor. Um, yeah, my opponent picked a good opening choice with the Scotch. Even if Queen E2 is not a way to play for a win, um, it does make it very difficult for me to play for a win. Although, as you're pointing out, yeah, I should just allow the doubled pawns, the doubled isolated C pawns, um, and trust that my extra tempi will be enough. Ah, the Peerts is also nice. Actually, yeah, I've read a book about the Peerts. I've actually played hundreds of Blitz games with it and committed much of the book to memory. That would be a reasonable choice for this kind of opponent. That would be something very difficult for an opponent to prepare everything. Yeah. I think the Peerts would be a better practical choice. Um, yeah, right. Although, yeah, if you avoid the exchanging lines, and that's the line I was thinking of earlier, um, then yeah, you can play for some something in that opening. I know some opponents who have played the Latvian. I don't believe in the Latvian. It's playable um, against many opponents, but I don't think it's any good. Um, not that I know all of it, but I've heard so much negativity about it that I'm not going to um, wager my games on it. Says the person who plays the fried liver. <laughs> I've got to learn the fritz or something. But moreover, yeah, maybe just stick with the Peerts if I'm in must-win positions. I could learn a lot from that and still get interesting games. Okay, but yeah, I missed my shot here, which is King G7. What does the engine say? I haven't actually checked this. The engine says, tiny, teeny little advantage for black. Um, after my game, yeah, the engine's like, you effed up, buddy. That's too bad. Um, yeah. So, there's a lot of tactics here, a lot of calculation, but my opponent didn't mess up. 
yet. So now I've given a pawn for some initiative, um, not intentionally. Um, yeah, and spectators afterward asked me, like, why don't you just, like, play rook f1 or rook f2 directly here, which is just much better. Why'd you spend this tempo on rook f3? And the answer is I didn't see what actually happened in the game. Um, yeah, also c5 is reasonable. c5 would be a sane way. Wait, black's better here? Black's down a pawn. Oh, this is not an opposite color bishop endgame. It's just a bishop endgame. Black's down a pawn. And he's better by a pawn. I don't believe that. That can't be right. What in the world is going on here? Rook 8f2. Oh, okay, so bishop d2 is not possible. Um, still... No. Oh my goodness. Guys, there's a term for this position. Do you know what the term is? Does anybody know the term for this sort of position? Yeah, but no, I I fully thought, okay, I've got compensation for a pawn, but I don't have more than compensation. No, I wouldn't... I mean, you could call it that. You could call it that. I've got another term for this. My choice of term here is... Um, this is Zugzwang. White does not have a good move here. Every move white has makes his position worse. That's why black's better. I'm not a moderator. I can't help. Sorry. Yeah, this is Zugzwang. Like, any rook move undouble, unconnects the rooks and makes it so, like, I have mating threats or win an exchange. As we just looked at there, bishop d2 is no good. Bishop can't go anywhere else. The only other thing that white can consider is pushing the a-pawn, but pushing the a-pawn doesn't help him at all either. Bishop d2 does kind of help. There's one little problem with it, and that's rook takes, rook takes, king h1, and this. I didn't see that. But because of that, like, White Stockfish says the best move White can do here is pawn h3, giving back the pawn. That's incredible. Wow. Um, I suddenly feel a little bit better about the way I played this. But I wish I'd kept my cool during the game. Like, I don't know, I keep thinking that I'm winning, I'm winning. Not here, but... Well, I guess here. I was like, rook f3, I get the pawn back. I was so excited to go from a terrible position to a position where I had this amazing tactic. And what is that tactic, you may ask? He takes on c7, I check, I check. I ch oh, I take here. And here I'm thinking, well, as soon as he moves the rook over, like, I don't know, c2, this is checkmate. So I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I just won an exchange out of a position where I was just much worse. He plays rook f1. I cry. Not really, just on the inside. And, yeah. Um... So I'm like, well, crap. Now I'm down two pawns. And, yeah, what do I do? 
So, okay, I hold on to my D pawn. I'm going to need to liquidate as many pawns as I can. And my opponent volunteers to trade um, one pawn for two pawns. So I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, I'll take that. And I threaten his pawn over there, and I stop his mate in one threat. And, yeah. So just to give you some kind of idea, like what kind of opponent I'm dealing with. They play d4 here. I mean, yes, it helps their bishop develop. It means that I don't have a rook on their second rank anymore. I'm not, like, threatening all kinds of obnoxious stuff there. And they do have a tempo to deal with my nonsense, but then I go back. And they threaten mate in one, and maybe they didn't see this, or maybe they thought I played bishop g7 or something. Um, in fact, they said as much during the game, but... Yeah, so I was not very pleased to have gotten a two-pawn down position against this opponent. Um, well, that's too bad, Plaster Hippie. If they're not going to help you, I don't know who will. Um, there's a reason I stay out of the whole mod moderation business there. That's because they're, well... I don't even need to get involved in it. You know, I'm not going to go there. You want me to go there, I'm not going there. So anyway, um, yeah. So I volunteer to go back and forth and finally call it a night. And so that's round five. So, yeah, it was quite the adventure. I escaped round five with a draw against a player 400 points rated lower than myself. But nobody in this tournament's a slouch. Everybody's having a pretty good result. Well, I mean, that's contradictory, but everybody's playing well, I think. Uh, certainly my opponent played a... a a challenging opening choice that made it very difficult for me to attempt for a win. Um, and, yeah. That's uh, what we were dealing with here. Um, I missed some opportunities in the endgame. Like, this rook f3 stuff doesn't work. I did consider I saw c5 during the game. I just didn't believe it. Had I noticed that bishop d2 just loses on the spot, and that, like, white's best move is to return the pawn with h3, um, then, yeah, I would have been much better off than I was, actually. So, um, yeah, I don't know. It was quite an adventure. I think it points to the fact that I don't really have a repertoire to play against lower rated opponents other than the Peerts, which I haven't looked at in forever, but I've studied it. So I think if I'm going to try to be in a must win position and try to beat an ill prepared opponent, uh, the Peerts is a good opening choice. But what we got here could have afforded me a win, you know, I'm willing to wager that had I played c5 here, I might have won this. I'm not saying I would have, but like supposing my opponent found this, this is not an easy endgame. I think my opponent would spend all their time. We would fight this out to the very last pawn, and I would still have some chances of winning it. Um... Yeah, there's a lot to calculate here. But really, I think my larger regret is having ditched my opening prep. I played knight f6 instead of bishop c5. Um, I'm always looking to try new things because I can learn from them. I just didn't expect this particular opening choice lesson thing to be so painful. I didn't know about this... Uh, I didn't recognize what a mess knight takes knight and then queen e2 is. Even though maybe once, maybe in one blitz game I've seen that um, played somewhere. 
Um, and it might not have been that opening either. Yeah, but I think that this is a dynamic enough position. And note that I no longer have those double pawns. Um, this is just a really crazy position. But not nearly as crazy as the four preceding games. This one has taken a much tamer, calmer approach. Um, which maybe does well to suit my temperament long term. But short term, it, it's all about that instant gratification. Playing stuff that you know better than your opponent. And then capitalizing the one time they make a tactical blunder. And you say, yay, I win. And move on and play the next game. But um, it's a lot more difficult um, to put in the work and um, play these calmer games and try to outmaneuver and outclass the opponent. Um, yeah. Right, no, I could be taking an A2 in some of these lines. It's just white gets a lot of activity as well. Um, so, you're right though, there's uh, that stuff out there. Um, so, I mean, you're looking at rook f1 check and assuming that, uh, wait, no, I take here. You're assuming that white takes it. Which, okay, that seems like a logical assumption. Um, my first intuition would just be snap the pawn because like even if white gets the pawn back your rooks are still on this open file um but okay yeah in fact taking is the best course of action otherwise white's king gets driven back to the first rank which is no fun all right so yeah king g1 or g2 um Oh, he means on 30. Okay, that, I was going to say, something seems really weird about this. Okay, so on 30, considering rook f1. Yeah. Um, rook f1. Wait, does this, no, this just transposes to the game. If you play rook 8 f2. Uh, no, you're... Oh, I'm sorry. You were suggesting white just takes the rook. That's right. This otherwise, uh, white's dropping the a-pawn. Um, I'm sorry, you can't go here. Right, I calculated that much. That doesn't quite work out. So white has to play king g2. Um, yeah, white doesn't take. Sorry, I'm exhausted. Um, but yeah, how do you improve from here? You're saying take here, bishop takes, and then what? And then rook f2? Oh, rook takes e1, and then, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, rook takes doesn't work. Yeah, I saw this during the game. Um, it kind of changes matters just a little bit although I think even if I'm taking the pawn it's not that great it is a pawn pawns are fun but this uh, G pawn hangs pretty quickly um, C7's hanging yeah that's fine Bishop takes, though, like, really puts the screws to black as to, well, what are you doing? <laughs> um, but, yeah, I think even rook takes might be okay. Uh, you just have to deal with all kinds of nonsense. You have to push your h-pawn and get out of the mating net. But, whatever. Um, yeah, end games are hard. I thought surely this rook f3 thing was, like, just winning the d-pawn. Um, because I'm like, there's no way he could play this, because this, now he can't play bishop takes on e1 anymore. So this is everything we had in the other variation, but, um, white's get, gotten a free tempo here. 
Um, so yeah, we get the Rook F1, we get the Rook 8 F2, nice little Rook box. Um, white has only one possibility. Um, oh, so you might have opted here for this. Although, unfortunately, this is a little bit different. Um, so, I'm not saying you would have opted for that, but it's something to at least think about. But, yeah, after Rook F1, which happened in the game, yeah, well, yeah, the other variation we were just looking at, Black's lost. Um, even here, Black is suffering pretty terribly. And so, but yeah, thankfully, uh, my opponent was exhausted or something, or just misevaluated this completely. Um... Usually, I do relish the a bill, um, the option of going into an endgame, but I keep picking opening choices that give me terrible endgames. So, um, but yeah, here I was totally fine with going into this. Um, I'm trying to remember. No. Yeah, Rook F4 is out of the question due to the mating net. Um, so. Um, yeah, he plays bishop f4, which is like the last thing I expected. Um, although I didn't see bishop h6. I was considering pushing h5 here. Honestly, I was. I'm not just making that up. Um, but then I realized, well, how do I defend the pawn? Uh, it's kind of a mess. But am I okay with that? Like, how bad is h5? Okay, it's not, at least Stockfish doesn't think it's too terrible. But it prefers Rook E2 for sure, as do I. Um, yeah, well, White's king is out of the game. That king is not getting back in. If White wanted to get that king into the game, the time to figure that out would have been here. Yeah. White should have thought about h3 before just snapping the pawn. Um, but it is a pretty delicious pawn. Um, no, I thought about h5 because, well, I mean, when you have the time on the clock, you think about what your options are. Um, Rook e2 isn't decisive or anything. You consider like what you can do because um, sometimes um, playing the accurate move makes the difference like here after rook e2 um, he could just play a4 he didn't have to play bishop h6 he could have played a4 and then rook b1 and then my rook on a2 or e2 looks a little silly although if he plays a4 Arms, yeah, if he plays a4 here. Okay, let's say I don't gang up immediately. I mean, if I do do this, um, I saw he has this. And, like, I can't win this. I retreat with my bishop. He gets out of the mating net. I think. Don't quote me on this, because maybe that's all. Uh, lies. Um, but what else was I looking for here? I don't think it was even that that I was concerned about. How was I thinking white was going to get out of this? I mean, black's not any better. Worst case, white just plays rook b1 and offers a draw, and what can black do? Black can take the pawn. White can move his bishop. Black can move his bishop. White can move his bishop. Black can move his bishop. I mean, you could do this all day. There's not really a whole lot to look at there. Black could try to move his king all the way across the board. Things get dicey. I don't know. I just think that, like, this is super drawish. 
White's up a pawn. Um, although bishop h6 is clearly good. Um, yeah, I had plenty of time around here. Um, still a little bit, I don't know, tired from my round four game. All right, see you around. Have a good night. Yeah, so, I don't know, what's the moral of the story here? I think it's just that, one, uh, I gotta play a little bit more, get more used to calculating for how many hours a day? Eight, nine, ten, something like that. Um, two, prepare openings better for uh, low-rated opponents who actually bother to learn their stuff. This is really unusual that I've not seen an opponent put so much care into what it is that they open with. I was surprised to see this. Yeah. E5 draws by force. is less than three. Don't play E5. Play this. Or play an Aliokin. Or play something. Play something that really strikes fear into the heart of your opponent. Like a Petrov. I just... This is absolutely nothing serious there. That's like the craziest move order you could take to ever get to a Petrov. Maybe it would happen in Ultra Bullet. Definitely not over the board. Anyway. So yeah, those are rounds one through five. Um, oh yeah, better time management once I think I'm winning actually calculate and verify it don't do what i do when i go over here and say puzzles and i'm like hey look there's a thing it probably wins like here here we got a leech us tactic right guys black's got a winning move here you know what i bet that winning move is 95 nope all right that's maybe knight f6 nope maybe h5 there it is and then you take the queen. Don't do that over the board. It does not end well. Um, so I've been doing too much of that with these puzzles because I'm like 2200 tactics trainer or leech us puzzles, whatever it's called these days. Um, somehow I'm 2200 and I still play like that here. So, um, yeah, don't do that over the board. Hope chess just doesn't work. Actually calculate it. Figure it out. Yeah. I think anything I prepare other than e5 would be good against a low-rated opponent. It's just e5 is my solid repertoire that I play against everybody if I want to draw or aim for a draw. Um, or better. If I'm not, yeah. So, like, if I'm playing up or playing against somebody my own rating, I'm totally fine playing e5. I know tons of ideas there. But if I'm looking for something more ambitious, I've got to play something other than e5. Or study, um, like, ten times as much as I currently do. Which is probably not happening. Um, yeah. And yeah, I, I know, like... One of my teammates plays the Elekin against everybody. And you can play a lot of really interesting games that way. And it's a pretty strong opening. I mean, it's named after Grandmaster. Grandmaster did pretty well with it. I'm sorry, a world champion. So it's got to be okay, right? Yeah. When all else fails, though, you could bust out a Pirates or a Modern or something simple. <laughs> simple, I say. But yeah, there's a, a lot of things to do. Um, yeah, that's us looking at all five games. So I've scored three and a half out of five against um, an, a slightly inferior field. Um, so that's a point better than two and a half out of five. Um, Years ago, uh, I would have much rather had a score 
of like four or four and a half. I tend to be a bit ambitious like that. Um, but, you know, I should be appreciative that I haven't played in a while. And that three and a half is a pretty solid score against serious opponents. Um, what I don't relish is that coming up soon, we'll have four more games against four experts. That's going to be exciting. Yeah. So, we'll see. Um, all on the same weekend, too. See how well I can do with that. Yeah. So, the plan is just win all four games. And then, like, go on and get master and, you know, that sort of stuff. No. I kid. The plan is to have some fun. Learn some things from the games. Um, it's going to be ballsy as heck to play um, queen pawn openings against them. Especially given that most of my queen pawn knowledge is academic rather than practical. It's a lot more about reading what other people have done than actually playing it myself. So it's going to be exciting to apply that. But also, um, with the black pieces, it'll be interesting to see if I can draw or win any games. Um, see, maybe I can actually um, maintain my rating where it's at. Or if not, you know, if I do end up losing tons of rating points, um, at least that qualifies me to get into uh, sections at money tournaments. So there's always that. Um, I know people who have done that deliberately and still have managed not to win in the said money sections year after year. Man. Yeah, there's always somebody who's super underrated in one of those. So, but... Um, anyway, we'll have some interesting games, I hope. I hope I don't get blown off the board too badly. We'll see. It'd be cool if I could actually go toe-to-toe -to -toe with these players, because, like, years ago, I was afraid to play against players 1,900 and above. Um, and here I'm thinking maybe I can handle it. Um, I'm a little bit more resourceful than I used to be. But we'll see how it goes. So, that wraps up um, two-part stream here. First part was going, doing a little bit of code review, revision, um, improving some source code uh, based on what they did on the standard Stockfish engine. Two, part two of this uh, was analyzing these five games, looking over them together. Um, I could have been more rigorous about this analysis, but then it would have taken all day. And that's no fun. So, yeah, thanks for watching. It's been fun, and I guess I'll see you next time. All right, I think I'll cut the VOD there. So, what was the result for the last game? Oh, no, we drew this. Um, uh, so, yeah, my last round game. Yeah, we just did a perpetual. Uh, or not a perpetual, a threefold repetition. My opponent actually played Rook F1 and then offered a draw. And, you know, I wasn't going to decline, although I could have been a jerk about it. Um, I could have said, well, you played the move, so it's not a threefold. But then I would have had to play something other than bishop c5. I wasn't going to do that. But yeah, good thing, good thing to know for over-the-board games. Um, if you're going to do a three-fold repetition, at least with FIDE rules, and I think with USCF rules, write the move on your score sheet, pause the clock, call the arbiter, make the claim. That's how it works. But yeah, we'll see. We'll see how it goes next um, next four rounds. Hopefully I'll have something to report on. In the meantime, maybe I'll read up on some openings. We'll see. But yeah, see you around.
have a good day, night, or whatever time of day it is.